Good morning. It's 9 a.m. May 10th, 2022, and I want to officially call to order the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors regular meeting. Clerk, can we have a roll call, please? Supervisor Friend? Here. Supervisor Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. And Koenig? Here. Thank you. You have a quorum. Thank you. We'll now have a moment of silence and Pledge of Allegiance. Does any board member wish to dedicate this moment to anyone or anything? Uh, yes, oh. Mr. Chair, this is, I'm sorry, this is Ryan Coonerty. I want to take a moment to recognize the passing of Gwen Markham. Uh, she owned Capitola Book Cafe, was very active in virtually every kind of community activity you could uh, be involved in, uh, cared deeply about this community and uh, will be deeply missed. Thank you. And uh, I'll uh, we'll remember uh, Jess Tessera uh, here in Watsonville. He was a great leader of the Filipino uh, community and uh, historian of the Filipino community in Watsonville. Thank you. Thank you. Moment of silence. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic which stands for the nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, proceed to item three. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda today? Yes, uh, Chair Koenig and members of the board on the regular agenda, um, there's a revision to item number 13, attachment B, page 87, remove the words any of, which now reads, the cannabis licensing official may set a larger cannabis cultivation area in CA zone districts subject to the following criteria. On item 14, attachment B, page 169, and attachment D, page 225, section F5 changed the wording to read, supporting equipment such as equip equipment shelters may be required to be placed underground if required by the director, section G.1, changed wording to read, all towers shall be designed to be the shortest height technically feasible. That concludes the corrections to today's agenda. Thank you. We'll proceed to item four. Are there any board members that would like, wish to remove something from the consent agenda to the regular agenda? I, I have nothing oh, to remove. Uh, I'll just make a comment. Uh, I want to welcome on item uh, 30. Su Supervisor Cabot, we'll take um, comment on the consent agenda after public comment, if you don't mind, item six. All right, thank you. We'll now proceed to item five, public comment. Any person may address the board. Speakers must not exceed two minutes in length and individuals may speak only once during public comment. All public comments must be directed to an item listed on today's consent agenda, closed session agenda, yet to be heard on regular agenda or a topic not on the agenda, which is within the jurisdiction of the board. Board members will not take actions or respond immediately to any public communication presented regarding topics not on the agenda, but may choose to follow up later, either individually or at subsequent board of supervisors agenda. Please go ahead. Morning, it's uh, Santa Cruz County, California. It is May 10th, 2020. It's nice to have the civilization obliteration assistance uh, eye contact, but I won't hold my breath on that. So uh, I'm holding an interesting document. It's called Your City Government. This one was made by a city council member in Santa Cruz. Uh, it just goes into a fair amount of detail that our um, people that were publicly elected, our city council members and also our supervisors are all under the control of the city and county managers. So much so that if they deviate from what they're doing, they can be um, charged with a misdemeanor, removed from our office or put in prison for six months. Just some interesting information. How about some humor? You know, a little girl 
comes to her mom and says, you know, mom, how are politicians made? She said, well, sweetie, when a circus clown and a serial killer meet and fall in love, you can make up the rest. So we've got a bunch of stuff going on with the World Economic Forum, stuff that's been planned since 1992, where 179 countries came into this agreement with this Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, and Agenda 2050. Um, it's an attempted power grab. So I have 41 seconds, that's good. So I love to be proved wrong. I uh, brought up a subject with a very close friend where 50 other people that were knowledgeable didn't dispute, didn't dispute what I was saying. Treaties do not supersede the US Constitution. And there's a lot of information about that. So unfortunately, most of our political leaders are, are captured. You know, I, I guess I have 14 seconds. You know, where are there the most um, <clears throat> Zionist IBM Nazis on the planet? I would say Washington, D.C. You know, I'd say that Israel is a close, is a, is a close second. Thank you, Mr. And Martin. then I would say uh, Silicon Valley. Good morning. My name is Shalak Kabanis, and I love Santa Cruz, and I have the privilege of sent, uh, uh, being chair of the Santa Cruz County Mental Health Advisory Board. I want to thank the supervisors for their service and uh, cap it. He attends every meeting. He uh, provides valuable leadership and insights. Very awesome. I want to thank Cassandra Salimi for all her work uh, for supporting our community uh, and wish her well as she becomes the director of behavioral health for Napa County. I want to support agenda item number 37. Currently, we don't have and we really need a youth crisis stabilization residential program. Uh, youth currently are sent away from their families, loved ones, community and friends. And we need to keep them here so that they can recover from behavioral health needs. Um, uh, please accept the grant for $7.5 million towards this residential stabilization program for youth. And finally, we submitted a letter and correspondence we need a 24 hour seven mobile crisis response in Santa Cruz County, the addition of which would complement current uh, resources. Uh, Mental Health Advisory Board strongly recommends that the Board of Supervisors consider the Criminal Justice Council report of 2021 and other past grand jury recommendations to take action to create a 24 hour seven non -law, law enforcement crisis response, which could complement the federal rollout of 988. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for your service. I love Santa Cruz. Thank you, Shalak. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for your service to our beloved community. I'm Jeffrey Arlt. I'm a member of the Mental Health Advisory Board for District 5. The mental health of our community is fundamental to the decisions we make in this room. Um, this letter um, has to do with the correspondence, why on the agenda, the letter of recommendation um, that can help reduce suffering and save lives. Uh, this letter of recommendation has to do with the taking meaningful action on cr the Criminal Justice Council Report 2021 that Shalak just mentioned, which says among the jurisdictions that don't already have dedicated unit with sworn officers responding to behavioral slash mental health calls, 100% are supportive of the creation of indep an independent agency that would respond to these calls. The Mental Health Advisory Board of Santa Cruz County strongly recommends that Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors in consideration of the Criminal Justice Council report and past recommendations, including Santa Cruz County grand jury reports, take meaningful action to create a 24 by seven non-law enforcement crisis response service that provides, but it's not limited to mental health crisis related crisis response, conflict resolution, welfare checks, suicide threats, and more. The federal legislation, HR 1319 American Recovery Plan Act passed in 2021, California AB 118 and the pending California AB 988 recommend and include funding for the 24 seven non-law enforcement response. The Mental Health Advisory Board strongly recommends that you take action on this. Um, again, thank you for your service. Thank you, Mr. Arlt. Good morning. Good morning, if you just pull the mic down uh, closer to your mouth down. so we can hear you. Good morning. 
My name is Stacy Smith. I'm here to advocate for creating a CAHOOTS type program in Santa Cruz County. And I'm grateful to be speaking to you during Mental Health Awareness Month. On Sunday, on a Sunday at 3.30 a.m. on October 16th, 2016, our son was shot to death by Santa Cruz law enforcement while he was in the midst of a mental health crisis. Individuals and families throughout our county would greatly benefit from the scope of services just mentioned by Jeffrey that the CAHOOTS model provides. Pressure can be taken off our first responders, lives can be saved. Many communities throughout the state and country have or are developing this well-proven best practices model for early intervention and crisis response. What is needed now is the will and commitment for allocating the funding to make these services available in our community. The time has come and the resources are available. The new 90-day call line becomes live in nine weeks on July 16th. It's critical that we have a 24-7 non-law enforcement, that we have mobile teams of trained crisis interventionists available for our community members. I urge you to open your hearts and minds and please allocate funding and begin working with those who have the knowledge and plans to make this program happen for Santa Cruz County individuals, families, which will promote safety for all. I believe it is very likely that Sean would be alive today if a CAHOOTS type program had existed in our community in 2016. When he suffered a mental health crisis and neither he nor our family were able to get the help we so desperately needed when we needed it. Thank you for your service to our community. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Hi, good morning. My name is Alexander Robertson. I'd like to start off with a prayer. Father God, give us strength and guidance and discernment. Let our walls come down so that we may receive your message clearly. I'm a Santa Cruz County resident of 34 years and a father of four. This is our home, much like most of us, I care deeply about its future. By show of hands, how many of you have taken the oath of office to be in a position where you are now? Good, both of you. In that oath was a pledge to uphold the Constitution of the United States and the California Constitution, also to represent we the people to the best of your ability. In assuming a leadership role, you are the guardians of the constituents who have elected you. The last two years have awakened us and we are now paying attention more than ever. We're examining those we have elected to serve us and protect our natural rights enshrined in the Constitution. As a whole, this Board of Supervisors has allowed trespass upon the rights of we the people. We have seen zero pushback from our elected leaders, no questioning, no curiosity, and a lot of just following orders. Just following orders is not going to be acceptable any longer. We the people will hold our elective representatives accountable. We expect independent study, scientific data, and open debate of information in regards to decisions that are made that affect us all. And I'll tell you, I've done the Freedom of Information Act requests for this information from the county and from the health officer, Gail Newell, and the response is, we have no data, we have no independent study, and we're just following orders. The good news is, is that today is a new day. We have the opportunity to correct our course and safeguard our future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robertson. Well, I can't say it much better than Mr. Robertson did. My name is Elisa DeQuag, also a resident of Santa Cruz County, um, mother of three. I also work in the mental health field. And to me, that's the most important thing. And I've just seen over the last two years, suicides and overdoses and just poor handling of the last two years. And I honestly hold you guys as co-centers to that. So I've, according to California law, you're required to be bonded as Alex said, to hold public office. And in case, 
and in case you cause any harm while executing your duties, this is a notice of my intent to file a claim against your bond if you do not resign in the next seven days. The paperwork I'm giving you will have all the details. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kirov. Nice coach you have. Uh, anyway, Gary Richard Arnold. Um, I know that this uh, county has been uh, really stasi eyed and uh, you can tell by the locks on every door, this is basically a fortress. Uh, people can't get information as men the person mentioned before. You've signed the UN United Nations Agenda 21 packet uh, that was also signed by Sam Farr. It was Bruce McPherson and Sam Farr that had a futures conference uh, in Monterey in which both the Pajaronian and the, uh, the Times and Aptos uh, labeled the meeting basically a, a, a fascist uh, Nazi-like uh, uh, operation. Uh, they were taking uh, brochures out of people's hands. Uh, they had the Delphi technique uh, by breaking up the meeting and having so-called leaderships from various tables. This was developed by Tavistock and the Rand Corporation. This is an intelligence operation to convert and change self-government to a Soviet. That's what AMBAG is. Why isn't community TV representing the 13 cities and three counties called AMBAG, CalCog. There's not a square inch in the state of California that isn't covered by a COG, a council of government, which is no more uh, than a Soviet. And we don't know which one of you are supposed to be. You don't come back and report from those meetings either. This is the most uh, unrepresentative government, the most uh, strong pro-communist government. We got two plaques out there on the courthouse steps dedicated to Hugh DeLacy, uh, Chinese communist spy, four different spy rings. Leon Panetta gave him military and policy information. You won't even take that down. It's outrageous. You're the enemy of the people. And the sooner they find out, uh, the better. You need to be replaced. No incumbent. What's happening in the schools and in the city councils is uh, under the Panetta machine. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Good morning, Chair Koenig. Board, mem board members. Uh, my name is Matt Machado. I'm Deputy CAO and Director of Community Development Infrastructure. This morning, I'd like to thank you for your proclamation. This is declaring the week of May 15th through May 21st as Public Works Week in Santa Cruz County. This is also a national event, and this year's poster is here. And the theme this year is Ready and Resilient. Uh, it does portray our public works professionals as heroes. Um, public works professionals are always ready to serve their communities and resilient as ever in their abilities to pick themselves up uh, when encountering challenges. And we have plenty of challenges here in our county. So I greatly appreciate your proclamation and, and awareness this week. Uh, I'd like to end by thanking our public works staff for their caring, their compassion, and their perseverance to do all the good work that they do. Thank you. Thank you, Director Machado, and to all our public works heroes. All right, seeing no one else here in the chambers, is there anyone on Zoom who would like to comment? Yes, we do have speakers online. As a reminder, it's star nine to raise your hand and star six to mute or unmute yourself. NBBM at cruzio.com, your microphone is available. Good morning, can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. I'm Nancy Macy. I live in Boulder Creek, where our children grew up as avid visitors and volunteers at the Boulder Creek Library. I was honored to be among the many participants who shared ideas and vision brought the library into being. Julie Mackey's ceramic art was recognized universally as remarkable, creative, and beautifully realized. She was among those artists chosen to provide lasting creations to grace the new Boulder Creek Library, a shared vision of the community that was intimately involved in its design. Her six faces originally among those sketched over weeks of watching people walking, talking, running errands, enjoying a stroll in downtown Boulder Creek. Julie loved people, honored humanity's varied colors, shapes, and cultures. She presented a young woman proud to wear her handwoven retail as a headdress, not hiding that she was from Guatemala, not seeking to blend in. 
A black man confident in his work, smiling with his cigar, symbolizing that he celebrated life. A young girl adorned in pigtails, dressed for a party or her picture day at school. A happy man with a large mustache, eyes crinkled from his smile. An elderly man, perhaps Shinto, expressing wisdom and thought. A smiling grandma in her blue cap. Julie's art was created as a display for the library and has been removed after being put there in February, being restored to its place. It would still be there uh, had the building been constructed well and not needed renovations. It is wonderful, however, having a library back remodeled with fresh and new spaces. Please return Julie's art, a rendering of the various faces and cultures of those living in our mountain community, a unified work of art made just for that place, the Boulder Creek Community Library. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ms. Macy. Jen Herrera, your microphone is available. Good morning, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, thank you. My name is, uh, good morning, Chair Koenig and board. My name is Jen Herrera. I'm one of the assistant directors at HSA. I'm here to thank you for this, uh, for the county's proclamation celebrating National Nurses Week, which is officially from May 6th through 12th. This year's theme is Nurses Make a Difference. As a fellow nurse specializing in public health, today I am representing the nurse leadership team at the Health Services Agency, in particular our directors of nursing, Anna Sutton, Angie Butters, and Rhoda Blankenship. And I do want to to do a special shout out to our amazing nurses at Health Services Agency, Human Services Department, our awesome Volunteer Medical Reserve Corps, and our WellPath partners. So as a nurse, I remember when I was in nursing school, um, my uh, professor uh, shared a survey, patient survey with us asking the patients what is their top quality that they wanted a nurse. And at the time as a nursing student, we all expected, oh, Patients want us to be compassionate, but actually the number one quality was competence. Patients want a competent nurse. And what I found over my career as a nurse is that competence and compassion go hand in hand. And when I think about this past year, all the, the nurses in our community have done an amazing job providing direct care, competent and compassionate care in our vaccine clinics, home visits, hospitals, uh, doing quality assurance administration and working even at the policy level. And through that work, they really have made a difference. Um, also during Nurses Week, it's also a great time to celebrate the that we are one part of an amazing healthcare team also want to appreciate all of the uh, the multidisciplinary team members like social workers, health educators, our own patients that we partner with to do this work. Um, so in closing, thank you so much for this recognition. Thank you to our colleagues who support nursing care and thank you to all the nurses in Santa Cruz County. Thank you, Ms. Herrera and all of the competent and compassionate nurses working for the county. Eldon Charles, your microphone is available. Good morning, am I being heard? Yes. Hello, my name is Eldon Charles. Um, I used to be a, um, a resident of Santa Cruz County. I moved a few years ago. I do have children though that live um, in that county. Elisa de Kiwag, one of the um, residents that spoke earlier and I have children that attend school um, in that county. In 1998, I moved from uh, the Caribbean, a very small island to the US. And um, I served in the military for 11 years. And as far as um, you know, countries go, I thought that the United States was the greatest country on earth at that time. I'm starting to second guess those feelings because of what I've seen occur um, in this place over the last two years, this COVID mania and the response of otherwise um, rational people has made me very, very concerned for the future of my children. I reached out to the Board of Supervisors to express my concerns in an email um, with some demands of some things that I wanted to see uh, with some other parents, the masking of our children and, and so on got no response, followed up, got no response. So it seems like the only thing um, that is understood is force and litigious action. So this is a notice 
um, that you have seven days, all of you, including the health czar over there, Gail Newell, uh, to resign, or I'm going to be taking action and filing a claim against uh, your bond. Let's see how it goes from there. And I'm going to be filing a civil lawsuit as well. Good day. Thank you, Mr. Charles. Sheila, your microphone is available. Thank you, Sheila Delaney. I live in Bonnie Dune, former resident of the San Lorenzo Valley. <clears throat> when the Boulder Creek Library was designed through a community process nearly 40 years ago, part of the design included works by local artists. A feature of our library has always been the six faces that welcome you from over the fireplace in the main room. The faces were created from composite images of people observed in downtown Boulder Creek and made into ceramic masks by Julie Mackey, the artist. The masks are members of our community. They should remain. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Delaney. Helen Ewan Story, your microphone is available. Good morning. I hope you all can hear me. Uh, good morning, Chair and Supervisors. I'm Helen Ewan Story from the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County. As you know, CAB is the county's designated community action agency tasked with eliminating poverty and creating social change through advocacy and essential services since 1965. We're also part of the national network of over a thousand community action agencies across the country who are celebrating Community Action Month this month in May. Community Action Month is a time for us to reflect on our mission, our partnerships, our values of equity and inclusion, and the difference we make in the community. In 2021, this included serving over 10,000 low-income people, including providing rent assistance to nearly 2,000 people to avoid evictions, food assistance to over 1,000, job readiness support and placement assistance to over 500 youth and adults, COVID information to over 1,300 people, including Indigenous language speakers, and impacting over 7,800 immigrants and their families with immigration legal, education, and advocacy services. And we sincerely thank the county for its partnership and its funding support in uh, helping CAB have this kind of impact in the community. To celebrate and raise awareness of Community Action Month, CAP is co-sponsoring events highlighting housing issues, immigrant voices and experiences, and climate resilience in May. CAP will also post highlight of its work on social media on Impact Wednesdays weekly during this month. For more information, we encourage everyone to follow CAP on social media. Check out our website at cabinc.org. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Story. Delilah Epperson, your microphone is available. Hi, thank you. I am Dalila Epperson and I'm a constitutionalist. And anybody who has looked, even scanned the constitution can see that the mandates that have been occurring for the past two, year, two years are unlawful. There are no laws for mandates, mask mandates, vaccination mandates. That's why these uh, progressive policies, this legislation like SB 866 is trying to get pushed through so hard, especially this year, when we all know that there's a red, white, and blue wave coming your way. I love the other speakers who spoke to the bonds, which you guys are under. I really uh, am looking forward to that because none of the incumbents None of our representatives stepped forward and said, no, the mandates are not right. So I wanna let you know, and I'm actually talking to the people who are listening, not the board, because I don't believe the board represents us or is listening to the people anymore. I wanna let you know that I am running also for Congress District 19, and I am a constitutionalist. And I love what you guys have been saying against the mandates, against 871 and against AB 2223, which I was in Sacramento to oppose that. So God bless you. 
And I hope to hear from everybody soon. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Everson. Joe, your microphone is available. Good morning, I'm Joseph Kuchera, a former member of your board. I was the board's representative to the library JPA when the Boulder Creek Library was designed by the community and also selected the local artwork to be permanently integrated into the building. One of the artists selected was Julie Mackey, who created six ceramic sculptures of local Boulder Creek residents that have been installed since 1984 and then reinstalled this February as part of the recent renovation. I'm here today representing the Mackey family and local community to inform you of the unilateral and precipitous actions of the newly hired Santa Cruz Library's director to censor and remove the Mackey sculptures just four days before the library's grand reopening based solely on her representation of a supposed anonymous comment by library staff that the sculptures were cultural appropriation, racial stereotyping, and offensive. Therefore, I urge you to take action to have the Mackey sculptures reinstalled in their home of 37 years for the following reasons. The censorship is a slippery slope. Your district's libraries and other public facilities may be next to suffer the acts of unaccountable censorship. The county is exposed to liability for damages incurred by this censorship without any due process or public awareness. And lastly, to investigate the unprofessional conduct of the library director's actions done in the shadows to unilaterally censor and remove artwork from public places. Thank you for this opportunity to address you today. Thank you, Mr. Conchero. Call in user three, your microphone is available. We live in scenic Santa Cruz by the ocean, and I'm going to read something called Cell Towers on the Ocean Floor. This is by Arthur Furstenberg of CellPhoneTaskForce.org and the author of the book, The Invisible Rainbow, A History of Electricity and Life. It starts out, one blue sky above us, one ocean lapping all our shores, one earth so green and round. Who could ask for more? That's from Pete Seeger. In 2018, on land and in space, preparations to deploy millions of antennas were very publicly being made and advertised for 5G, smart cities, and the Internet of Things. At the same time, and without any publicity, governments, research laboratories, and commercial and military interests were collaborating on plans to create smart oceans and the internet of underwater things. They did not consult the fishes, whales, dolphins, octopuses, and other inhabitants at those depths. Life in the oceans today is hanging by a thread. If the rate of population declines continues, there will be almost no fish left in the oceans by 2048. Diatoms, the type of algae at the base of the ocean's food chain that is also the source of a third of the world's oxygen production has been you, declining by more than 1%. There are no further speakers. Okay. All right, then we'll move on to item six, action on the consent agenda. Does any member of the board wish to speak to any member on the, or any item on the consent agenda? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'll be, I'll be very brief. Uh, thank you. Just on three quick items on item 28, just a welcome to uh, Samantha hart Farron, an outstanding local community member who's going to be joining us on the Women's Commission. Appreciate her willingness 
to serve. On item 37, as, as was brought up by the speaker on the Chaffa grant, uh, an enormous need and an enormous opportunity for this county to start investing in exactly this. Uh, so appreciation for those that sought the grant and uh, appreciation for the board for moving that item forward. And the last is on item 48, uh, something, uh, an area, Green Valley, that I share with Supervisor Caput, uh, an area that both Supervisor Caput and I have prioritized for pedestrian safety over the last few years, including uh, using some of our Measure D and other funding in order to improve some of the walkways down there. It's uh, used by disadvantaged community members, used by farm workers from a, as a transport and recreational standpoint, and to have public works apply for and successfully obtain a competitive grant to improve pedestrian access in that area for that community is, is really outstanding and appreciation for the CAO's office uh, for their willingness to help on the local match that's required as part of this. But this is a improving pedestrian safety in the South County, uh, well, throughout the county is, is obviously a priority, but to have this access point in Green Valley moving forward is, is really wonderful. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Supervisor Caput. Yeah, thank you. Uh, item uh, 30, I'd like to welcome uh, Cesar de Santos uh, as an appointee to the Latino Affairs Commission. And uh, also on item 31, uh, recognize the great work of the Aztecas uh, Youth Soccer Academy that is uh, helping a lot of uh, youth in the uh, South County. Uh, lastly, uh, it was already mentioned, item 37, uh, the grant for $7.6 million uh, for the uh, uh, health facility on Freedom Boulevard in Watsonville. It's going to be a, a great project, and I'm looking forward to seeing the uh, work begin. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Supervisor Coonerty? Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. On item number 29, I want to thank uh, the chair for joining me and for staff uh, for their work and putting the ask, uh, applying for the putting to assets to work incubator. I think it's an exciting opportunity for us to build on some of the work we've already done and figure out a way to uh, meet the needs of this community and, and generate more resources uh, for, for the county as an institution. Item number 31, I want to also thank the Santa Cruz Community Foundation uh, for their support of the Azteca soccer program. It's a tremendous program and, uh, and it's a great partnership. On item number 36, which is uh, providing, creating an evaluation of integrated behavior health services and their effectiveness, I just want to add additional direction uh, that, that whatever the uh, evaluation is, that it should come back to the board so that we can um, see the evaluation uh, for ourselves and uh, <clears throat> set policy accordingly. And finally, on item number 39, I want to thank the Health Services uh, Agency for applying for additional funds for MAT uh, Medicated Assisted Treatment uh, that is uh, just critical in addressing the crises that we're seeing on our streets uh, every day. And uh, I want to appreciate the efforts to grow and expand the program that uh, this important program that we provide in our community. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. Supervisor yeah, thank Kennedy. you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to um, address a couple of issues. Uh, item number 27, the traffic uh, demand management issue. Uh, this is a good step toward providing additional incentives for builders to do small and medium sized housing projects along transit corridors. I look forward to seeing um, the next iteration of in the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan and have a deeper discussion on uh, about the TDM measures included in the draft plan. Uh, and well, also want to address uh, what some of our speakers did on items uh, 36 to seven, the behavioral health investments. Uh, thank you for the staff for both of these items for uh, consideration. They uh, they really do represent a better uh, critical effort for uh, to provide uh, behavioral health services and track our outcomes to a higher degree. Um, better addressing behavioral health in this county is a critical component to addressing homelessness in, in our community. Um, and I, I'd like um, a question, uh, I don't know if it could be answered right now, but I'd like more information about the nexus between these two items and our overall housing for health strategic plan. 
specifically could uh, somebody say some more about uh, the outreach uh, and how the outreach will work for us to reach uh, our participation goals i think that's going to be important um, i don't know that it could be answered right now but i uh, would like to take a deeper dive into that um, in the same vein uh, item 39 uh, as the behavioral health pe uh, pieces i'd like uh, uh, this important issue uh, to address one of the most difficult challenges we're facing in Santa Cruz County and really statewide. Uh, I'm very supportive of doing uh, what we can to expand our treatment options uh, for those folks who are struggling with uh, opioid and uh, other uh, addictions. Again, this is a major contributing factor uh, on our homeless problem here and especially throughout the state. Um, and it's um, really co-occurring with the mental health issues that we're facing as well. Um, on item 41, the encampment management uh, item, I, I want to acknowledge the county's role in trying to address better sheltering options for people experiencing homelessness in our community. There are real public health and safety issues that uh, and risks that are posed by the bench lands and encampment just outside the county center here, as well as, well as environmental damage uh, next to the critical natural resource of the San Lorenzo River. I, th I want to thank the city and county staff uh, who have been working on resolving encampments along the river. And uh, still, um, there is a lot of work to do, as we all know. Uh, one question that I do have on that as well is the report says the grant is expected to help at least 65 individuals. And I just uh, wonder, how do you arrive at that number? And is it based on an average cost per, uh, per person for assistance? Um, this is a very costly um, item that we're going to have to address uh, if we want to, to help resolve the, the critical issue that's before us. I don't know if the, um, the, uh, the CAO may have a, an answer on some of that. Yes, uh, Chair Koenig, if, uh, we do have staff available to respond to the questions if you'd like to do that right now or... I think that if that's okay with the chair, I'm just please, like, fine with me. Yes. Yeah. Please. The, the, uh, the first one on 30, so the behavioral health investments. Um, you know, the, the nexus, um, the overall housing for health strategic plan. Um, is there anybody that could answer some questions on that question? Yeah, we have Dr. Uh, Ratner, Robert Ratner, uh, if you could Great. elevate him um, so that he can uh, respond. He's, he's on line. Great. He's been promoted. Good morning, supervisors and uh, Supervisor McPherson. Thank you for your question. My name is Robert Ratner. I'm the director of the Housing for Health Division in the Human Services Department in the county. And I think your first question was around how the behavioral health related interventions uh, fit in with our overall approach to addressing homelessness in the county. Correct. And uh, our strategic framework really outlines a couple of things that are related to what's before the board today. One is um, that we identify health as a major and health challenges as a major contributor to housing instability and challenges that people have getting back into housing. So substance use and mental health issues can really interfere with people's ability to manage the tasks that are required to get into and keep housing. So paying your bills, being a good neighbor, um, managing utilities, keeping your room um, safe and clean. Those are all things that require people to have the kind of health supports to be successful. So uh, from our perspective in Housing for Health, the kind of the housing plus the healthcare services are really critical. And the behavioral health supports that are outlined in some of the measures today are, are part of that process. For example, some of the crisis intervention resources, when someone has a, a crisis and they may need to temporarily relocate from housing, if there's a facility they can go to and get more stability, it makes it much more likely that they would be able to keep their housing. In the absence of those kinds of facilities and people are struggling, um, we see people who lose their housing as a result of being unable to pay rent or behavioral issues that can interfere with their tenancy. And then your, um, I think your second question was related to the cost of the interventions. And I think it is surprising to a lot of members of the public how expensive some of the housing related interventions are for folks experiencing homelessness in California. And that's really a byproduct of how expensive it is to live in our communities. So the fair market rent for a studio apartment in Santa Cruz County, which is um, a HUD established standard is over $2,000 a month. So when you're trying to help people get back into housing with temporary subsidies or ongoing subsidies, just eight months of 
rental support in the studio could be up to $16,000. Um, and then that cost of services is also something that I think a lot of people are not aware of. So I appreciated you raising it, but to have integrated field-based services where we're paying staff um, reasonable wages so they can afford to live in our community and as well um, be really effective and supported in their work with folks who are struggling with behavioral health issues. We need to, to pay people adequately. So I think the overall cost in the proposal reflects that um, doing this work uh, requires deep ongoing investments to really make changes. One thing I would say is that we're partnering with the Behavioral Health Department, I work in the Human Services Department on their Healing the Streets grant, as well as with the Central California Alliance for Health on their Medi-Cal reform. So I think with our encampment resolution proposal, I'm hoping we can direct more of the money towards some of those housing related costs. It will help people get back into housing and we can use some of those other sources for some of the services costs. Um, and uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but happy to clarify if you Yeah, I, I think it does. It, um, it, just the complexity and the, the costly nature of, of trying to resolve the homeless problem here and throughout the state and throughout the nation is just uh, um, unbelievable in some the eyes of many and myself included. Uh, but I, I, I think that uh, the fact that we do have a strategic plan and we're trying to get there as quickly as we can um, to address the homeless situation in our county. Uh, I do thank you for your explanation. Uh, it's a tough um, problem to resolve uh, very quickly and it's going to be very costly. And uh, I think that that gives a better explanation of just how we're how we're moving on it and how costly it really is in Santa Cruz County in particular. So thank you, Mr. Radner. Thank you. Are you yeah, finished? Sorry. Thank, thank you, you Supervisor yeah. McPherson. All right, well, um, uh, I'll just make a couple brief comments on item 27. I want to thank Supervisor McPherson and the planning department for a discussion, discussing potential additional amendments for the transportation demand management program and the sustainability update. The environmental impact report, the draft that has come out identified vehicle miles traveled is, is the most significant potential impact of the sustainability update. And hopefully the, these improvements to the transportation demand management program, uh, adding additional incentives and uh, creating a funding program for Metro will uh, help to address that. So I look forward to the next draft on that. On item 29, I also want to thank Supervisor Coonerty uh, for bringing this to my attention. And I think this application for putting assets to work, the incubator program, will really help us leverage our county uh, real estate assets to build the housing that is so desperately needed in our community, as Dr. Ratner uh, was just saying. And I think we're well positioned to receive, uh, um, to be accepted into the program, thanks to the long range facilities plan uh, that we prepared with Gensler and approved last year. Uh, also, I certainly uh, agree with item 37, um, that this 7.6 million for construction of the Children's Crisis Stabilization Program at the Freedom Health Campus is going to be a huge win for our community. I'm aware that they recently did this in Monterey and it's working incredibly well. Uh, the challenge is that they still don't have enough room um, and hopefully um, also the support of an adult crisis center at Harbor Vet Building will uh, help to address the issue as well. On item 41, I want to thank uh, the Human Services Department and Housing for Health Division for uh, quickly applying for the state resources. And it's fantastic that we've received $2.37 million for encampment cleanup. Hopefully uh, working with the city of Santa Cruz, we can be good partners on this uh, and leveraging all the, all the funds for various parts of uh, the, ad addressing homelessness and encampment cleanup as Dr. Ratner just explained. Uh, also, item 43, approving $350,000 for new modular building for the sobering center. This is a much needed resource in our community, and it'll be good to get that back. And finally, on item 51, approving road closure for the Pleasure Point Street Fair on June 25th. It's just a, great to see more in-person events coming back and hope to see you all at the street fair uh, on June 25th. Thank you. Are there, is there a motion on the consent agenda? I move we approve the consent agenda. Well, second. And, and it's just, and that's as amended, correct? Correct, yes. Yeah. Okay, motion by Supervisor McPherson to accept the consent agenda with amendments uh, proposed by Supervisor Coonerty and seconded by Supervisor Caput. Any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote, please. 
Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. That item passes unanimously. All right, the consent agenda being passed with amendments will proceed to item seven, presentation by Brian Largay, the Land Trust Director of Conservation on plans for community harvest trails at Watsonville Slough Farm as outlined in the memorandum with the County Administrative Officer. Mr. Largay. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Koenig, and thank you, Board of Supervisors, for allowing me to speak with you today. Uh, I, I, I just do want to remark that I am so grateful for your service, uh, seeing the uh, consent agenda reminds me what critical matters you're, you're addressing, and um, I, I'm grateful for your leadership, so thank you. Uh, I'm here today to speak about the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County and, and some of our programs. And I have a slide presentation and I'll just say next slide as uh, we make our way through it, if that sounds good. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Uh, the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County was established in 1978. We're a nonprofit organization uh, serving all of Santa Cruz County and our mission is to protect care for and connect people with the places that make this area special. And uh, Santa Cruz County is a, a spectacular area. We are so uh, blessed to, to live here. Uh, we'll be talking today about the Watsonville Slough Farms down in the Paco Valley, which is the top left picture here. Bottom left is from the Glenwood Preserve, where uh, in Scotts Valley, we manage uh, endangered species habitat, uh, cattle grazing and recreational trails. Uh, the bottom center image is of the Santa Cruz Sand Hills, which we manage for groundwater recharge, endangered species habitat, and sustainable fire uh, management projects. And the bottom right is our burn mill iron forest in Corlitos, where we manage uh, watershed protection, sustainable timber harvest, and, and recreational trails. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our toolkit is that we protect and manage land. And by protect, that means uh, we engage in real estate transactions and uh, put encumbrances such as conservation e easements on land that prevent uh, further development. Uh, we're involved in about 16,000 acres around Santa Cruz County uh, and a couple neighboring counties. Uh, and we also accomplish uh, what we do through partnerships. We collaborate extensively with uh, agencies uh, at the state, uh, federal and local level, uh, regional level, as well as other nonprofits and businesses in the area. Next slide. Uh, recently, uh, some of our work has included the Highway 17 tunnel. Uh, construction of that just got underway uh, a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we're building trails at San Vicente Redwoods, which should open this fall up in Bonnie Dune. Uh, our trails at Glenwood are, are full of uh, recreational visitors. We have about 100,000 people a year hiking on those trails. Uh, the wildflowers are still blooming if you uh, need some exercise up there. And uh, we're uh, a fundraising uh, champion for the rail trail, trying to get that built as soon as possible. Uh, and we're launching a new initiative down uh, along Highway 101 to connect the Santa Cruz Mountains with the rest of the state of California with a, a wildlife crossing over Highway 101. Next slide. Uh, so today I'm here to introduce a, a new project to you at the Watsonville Slough Farm. We're, we're calling the project Community Harvest. And this is an invitation to the community to harvest and enjoy healthy food together while learning about agriculture and nature thriving side by side. And this is, gets at one of our key themes um, where we try to make land, manage land, protect land to achieve multiple benefits. Uh, and in this case, it's a vibrant habitat and uh, healthy food uh, next to each other. Next slide. <clears throat> Uh, so this uh, property is located off Highway 1 between the city of Watsonville and Monterey Bay. Uh, it's uh, uh, quite close to uh, the Pacro Valley High School. Here in the slide, it's, uh, it's uh, encompassed in a, in a white line encircling uh, what you can see are some farm fields and then some wetlands winding through the middle of the property. Next slide. Uh, this property uh, produces uh, uh, vegetables and berries on 240 acres. The Paco Valley farmland is astonishingly productive. This one property produces uh, 90,000 servings of vegetables and berries a day. <laughs> 
Ooh, that's sinking a little bit. Uh, the uh, value of that produce is $3 million a year. It supports about 100 jobs. Um, it also has extensive habitat areas, 240 acres of wetlands and grasslands, 200 species of birds have been observed there, uh, listed uh, that is special status frogs and turtles occur on the property. Uh, and one of the exciting things is that, uh, that this property does both together. It's, it's not uh, one or the other. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the uh, project uh, was the result of an extensive partnership involving 11 different agencies and organizations uh, shown here. Uh, in 2011, it received a presidential award for coastal partnerships, and we're grateful to our, all of our partners. Uh, we collaborate with them still to get the work done there. Next slide. Uh, the Community Harvest Project is the result of extensive outreach to the community. We had about 24 different tours of the property, several webinars. We posted flyers and notices uh, in all the local uh, grocery stores and beauty salons and at, uh, neighborhood churches around, uh, around the project area. We reached out to Pajaro Valley High School and surrounding areas. Um, and we are focused on, on food because what we discovered is a, a great interest in the farm production there and access to healthy food. About 90% of Pacra Valley High School families suffer from food insecurity. And with the upcoming construction of the Lee Road Trail, there's exceptional opportunity to have uh, uh, walking access from town to this property. It's about a half mile from the city. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, so the goals are to provide public access to healthy food at Watsonville Slough Farm, to protect the vibrant agricultural operations there and the natural resources and involve the community in planning. Next slide, please. The, uh, here's a close up of the Lee Road entrance. That's Lee Road in the foreground. Uh, and you can see a finger of the slough uh, surrounded by, uh, these are wood chips we laid down uh, to suppress weeds. Uh, this photo was taken about a year ago. And uh, the idea is to have a gateway at this entrance that will provide uh, consumer harvest facilities and, uh, and demonstration of sustainable agriculture in action. Next slide. Uh, as by community harvest, we need food. Uh, there'll be harvest areas where people can pick produce. Uh, it'll be free. We anticipate partnerships uh, and subsidies from our lease revenue to, to pay for the production. Uh, there'll be picnic areas and restrooms uh, to enjoy the food, uh, stations to wash and prep produce. Uh, we're currently collaborating with Esperanza Community Farms, a, a prominent local nonprofit that produces uh, CSA, community supported agriculture boxes for, for limited resource families in the area. They operate land on site, and this is an example of their, their recent harvest. Uh, we'll also have a farm stand where growers who operate on our property could sell their produce if they so choose. Next slide. Uh, we're also looking at demonstrating thriving nature side by side with agriculture, including trails, uh, boardwalks and platforms and a remodel of our barn, which we just started looking at recently. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the current status of the project is we're still in the design phase. We haven't yet submitted to the county. Uh, the property is zoned commercial agriculture. The regulatory compliance approach uh, with regard to that zoning it will be cons uh, that consumer harvest uh, is a principal permitted use. Uh, and the uh, goal is to establish a concept design over the next couple of months and submit for regulatory review this summer. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the timeline is that we hope to go into construction next year in 2023, open to the public in 2024. Uh, we anticipate operating costs of about $100,000 a year. The land trust uh, uh, secures about $300,000 a year from the lease revenue of the agricultural operations on the property. And so achieving that um, operating cost is, uh, that should be uh, within, within our means. Um, we hope to add boardwalks and uh, extra uh, wildlife engagement uh, viewing platforms and whatnot in 2025, and then um, perhaps the barn remodel if we go there in 2028. 
Next slide. Uh, so our next steps are to finalize the concept design, launch county review, uh, continue to advocate and uh, support insofar as we can by securing funding for the Lee Road Trail, which is this uh, connection between the uh, the city of Watsonville and, the, and goes right by the property. We hope the, the bridge part of the Lee Road Trail may eventually be supported. That would connect the, the property in Pacro Valley High School all the way to downtown, which would be uh, Fantastic, uh, and we're we are doing an awful lot of grant writing. Uh, we we actually have a tour uh, in just two weeks with the uh, state parks. Um, they've uh, we've made the next round for a three million dollar grant for for funding, which we're optimistic about. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, excuse me. That's it. Yes, uh, your questions and uh, any comments that you have, we're open to suggestions. Uh, love to get insight into how to do this better, uh, but we're also happy to, to answer questions. Thank you, Director Largay. Are there questions or comments from members of the board? Just Mr. Mr. Chair. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I, and I appreciate the, the board's willingness to have this presentation. I'd ask the land trust to, to daylight this because I mean, let me first say that if you haven't been to the property, it is it is one of the most stunning properties in all of Santa Cruz County and an absolute hidden gem in South County to be able to open it up for access for the South County community, uh, both with its heritage on the agricultural side, but to have nature within walking distance, to have that extent of open space and unspoiled open space. This will quickly become a real treasure in South County, uh, especially given the lack of accessible parks and open spaces throughout the South County area. I think that this is going to fill an enormous need and also uh, present a, a life lab and learning opportunity for members of the community. I had the, the privilege of, of touring it last year with um, uh, Mr. Palacios as well, and, and members of, of my staff. Uh, we are fully supportive of, of the application as it comes forward to the county. And and I know that uh, Mr. Palacios has also been working on this all the way since uh, Measure U and, and, uh, of 20 years ago. So uh, uh, Mr. Palacios, I imagine you have a few words you'd like to say as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Largay. This is a very, very exciting project. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Koenig, members of the board. Just want to give a little bit of history on this project. This project um, uh, is a famous uh, Thai property. Of course, if you go back, uh, it was actually slated for development in the 1994 Watsonville General Plan. And there were, um, it was proposed for housing and other other things. And there was a big, um, lots of fighting over that. The, the fighting was resolved in 2002 with the passage of Measure U and other negotiations regarding uh, the, the uh, establishment of Paro Valley High School. So at that time, the city of Watsonville, the county of Santa Cruz, um, um, and the Coastal Commission entered into a historic agreement to set aside this property from development, to protect it from development as open space. Uh, so that is 2002, and the promise was made at that time to the city uh, and the county that the land would be made available to the public for open space and for recreation and other things. So this is a great moment for us and we really appreciate it. Thank you to the land trust and we really wanna be supportive because I know the community um, needs open space in, in the whole county, but especially in South County, there's a lack of open space, a lack of trails, a lack, lack of recreation areas. And so the ability to see this and stunning and beautiful property that has been preserved for future generations, but to take advantage of it for hiking and learning about environmental issues uh, is all very, very important. And so we really support it and thank you for the land trust. And we are here to support you in any way to make this happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, CAO Palacios. Supervisor Caput. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you, Brian, uh, for your presentation and uh, thank uh, Carlos Palacios and Supervisor Friend uh, for all the work they've done. Uh, it's, uh, it's exciting to see more open space and the public able to go in there and use it uh, for South County. Uh, it's just a wonderful project. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. 
Supervisor McPherson? I just want to uh, acknowledge, and I, I agree with everything that Supervisor's friend and uh, Caput have said. I just want to say to the Land Trust of, thank, of Santa Cruz County, thank heavens you got here 44 years ago. Because what you have done the past 44 years is amazing, not the least of which recently was just the participating very heavily in the wildlife crossing of Highway 17 uh, at the Laurel Curve. Uh, what you have done throughout this county is it makes it better for everyone and every segment of this county. So um, thank you for everything you've done in the past. And as you can see in your presentation that the public can see, um, these, these things take time. And uh, you have years of 2025 and 28 and all, but that's what's needed to get these things done. It takes time, but you've had you've had tremendous success in the past and you have a great vision for the future. So I really thank the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County. Thank you. And uh, I just want to add my voice uh, to the uh, in support of the land trust and uh, Mr. Largay and sp uh, specifically in their ability to work with communities uh, and make sure that they're good neighbors uh, in building these pr projects. Um, all the projects that uh, the land trust and Mr. Largay have been involved with in my district has done a fantastic job of uh, reaching out and hearing concerns, building, addressing them, building them into the process and making sure that we keep accessibility uh, and preservation of our environment uh, at the forefront. And so um, this is just another example of that. And I want to just take a moment to appreciate that particular skill, which is um, uh, often not recognized, but incredibly important on projects like this. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. I'll just add that I had had one opportunity to go out to uh, the Slough Farm property. It is truly breathtaking. And yet I, I still had no idea that it was as large as it is. So I'm looking forward to it being open to the general public and to being explore, uh, if not all 480 acres, because I know a lot of that is, is Slough, at least uh, more of it. So thank you very much. I'll open it to members of the public. Is there anyone uh, here in the chambers who would wish to address us on this item? Seeing none, is there anyone on Zoom who wishes to address this item? We do have one speaker. Call in user three, your microphone is available. Thank you for that presentation. Having lived in the county for 40 years and 20 of those years being a public school teacher in Watsonville, uh, farming is very near to my heart, especially organic farming and ecological farming. And I'll make a brief statement and then I have a, a question. Um, we had a group of teachers and community members, parents called Farm Without Harm because we advocated for uh, organic farming next to the schools. And actually everywhere I do, <laughs> I think it should be required that pesticides are not used and there's organic and ecological farming. I would have to take my children in from the playground at um, a Mesty school a number of times when there was spraying of the fields next to the school and they're coughing and their eyes are watering. So um, you talk about we can make things better. This does sound like something we really need and about being good neighbors and preservation of our environment. We can enhance that by seeing that we are not poisoning the environment or allowing it to be poisoned and requiring um, organic and ecological farming. My question is, are the tour you mentioned, is that open to the public? Because that would be 
very worthwhile. And um, what number? Uh, Thank you, Ms. How Karen. many of these? We have no further speakers for this item. All right, thank you. Then I'll return to the board. This is an informational item only. Um, so if there's no further comments, so one more thank you, Director Largay, for the presentation today. And uh, right, well, thank you very much. It's an honor to uh, to present before you, and and thank you for all the the kind words. Uh, in case it wasn't clear that the farm in question, uh, the Watsonville Slough Farm, is an organic farm, uh, and it uh, as long as people stay away from the tractors, it should be quite safe uh, for, for visitors. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. We'll now proceed to item eight, a presentation on the county's online budget platform to accept and file the 2022-2023 county proposed budget to be considered during budget hearings, accept the tentative budget hearing schedule, schedule June 21st, 2022 as the date of the budget hearings will begin, schedule a public hearing on June 28th, 2022 to, to consider amendments to the county's unified fee schedule and take related actions as outlined in a memorandum of the county administrative officer. And for a presentation, we have our county budget director, Marcus Pimentel and Sven Stafford. I believe your microphone is is off there, Mr. Pimentel. But you're the first. Pre I think you're the first presenter. Right here, man. There you go. Good morning, Chair Coney. Good morning, Supervisors. Annually, my error. Um, I am proud to present to you today our new online budget for the County of Santa Cruz for our proposed 22-23. Uh, budget. Before I jump into that, today's presentation is about navigating through the budget itself. Um, included in the in the board packet are more details about the proposed budget that will be conducted in, in, in deep and spirited budget hearings in later in June. Uh, so today we just want to navigate you and orientate the public about our online budget. Uh, before jumping into that, I am here with our principal administrative analyst, uh, Sin Stafford, who really led this project and did a beautiful job in envisioning how we can integrate the county's budget with our strategic plan to align our decision making and what we fund to how we get it done. Um, this project wouldn't have been as successful as it already is, also without the partnership of many county players, uh, county council, uh, many members of our CAO team, but in particular, our ISD department, uh, Tammy Weigel is here today as our ISD director, and two of their staff, uh, Tom Melkonian and uh, Yan Jong, um, were instrumental in designing this, custom designing this to fit our, our needs. And when we envision what an online budget could be, we've far surpassed that already in, in year one of this first version. So we're really excited about that. The goal of this project was to unite our budget policy, how we fund things to our strategic plan, but it's also to build trust, confidence, and accountability into the budget process, being able to see within a department's budget, their emerging issues, their links to their strategic plan, their commitments to the operational objectives, and then to simplify the county's budget process, moving from a proposed document to a supplemental document, to a concluding document, to a adopted document that really does does injustice into having a, a, a process that's clear and, and articulate and in one space, you can see the whole decision process. So this year we do have a small printed version. We have our budget in brief that is meant to be a transitional document. It's a downloaded PDF, 318 pages, that offers the ability to see um, the key components of the budget in, in a printable, downloadable form. Um, with that, I wanna jump over to our website. Thank you. And this is our proposed 22-23 budget website. It lives within this uh, strategic plan, this uh, vision Santa Cruz County. And within the budget website, it begins with, how do I use this website? So we thought we'd put prominently right below the the, adder, the, the header, um, some navigation tips, including a, an instructional video on key elements to 
better understand and, and move quickly around the website and get the, the key content our community needs. We also have navigation tips. We have reference manuals. We have glossaries. Uh, government is fear full of a lot of um, large words and often complicated um, information. So we have a, a very in-depth glossary to help orientate any of our users to that. I want to move over into our economic outlook and financial summary section of the website. The website's grouped into uh, some main components, and this is a great starting spot for anybody in our community. Um, we've offered a, a more robust economic outlook for our that recaps our national economy, our state economy, and and what's going on here locally. We've where we've been able to we we referred to our data share Santa Cruz content that's also rich out there in the community. So we're trying to bring in all these data sources and resources into one site and, and allow them to be interconnected. Within this section is also our financial summary. This is specific to the County of Santa Cruz. This is about our proposed budget. And it offers the users a, a glimpse of our forecast for the coming year, um, some major highlights of our funding status by funds, and more resources about our spending, spending trends, our revenue trends. It's just a, a, a meant to be a really nice, condensed way to get a quick summary of what's going on in our budget. There's also much more information in there about our personnel, um, you can see our line out in detail of our proposed, our proposed budget and a very interactive debt service schedule where you can click a, a, a particular debt issue and, and understand how long it is and, and when, it, uh, when it would be paid off. There's also a wonderful section we're very excited about in what the county does. So within this section, there's five different options, and one of them is your tax dollars at work. Thank you, Sven. <clears throat> so we begin with this section uh, illustrating a, a, a narrative of um, when we drilled down uh, uh, late into 2021 and really looked at our funding structure, we noticed a trend in that the, our particular county is very unique in, in, in the sense that we're systematically underfunded as compared to our county peers and, and peers across the state. Um, what this chart illustrates is in the top left quadrant is Santa Clara County. They receive the highest per capita sales tax and property tax in the state and serve the lowest population in the state. They serve about 4% of their county population. Contrast that with the Santa Cruz County, we serve half of our population, 50%, and at a, at a much reduced uh, rate. When we look at our peers, we're about 10, uh, one tenth of our funding on property tax with our peers um, and about half of our property tax, our sales tax with our peers. So we are just systematically underfunded. It's the nature of how property taxes were allocated in prop, uh, uh, 1970 Prop 13 and many of the, the changes that have happened over the last five decades. There's also a, a tool on how to see property tax. We've often thought about or talked about how few dollars we get out of property tax. We get about 13% of every property tax dollar paid. What we now have is the ability to drill deeper into that. And for one example, uh, you can look in this chart and you see of every thousand dollars in property tax, 568 goes to our local county schools, which is fantastic. Now you have the ability to drill into that and see those allocations within those schools and to see how it's spread throughout throughout the county by schools. So it's just we're trying to offer more rich content wherever we can in this for very first um, online website. With that, I want to turn it over to Sven, who will talk a little bit about county services, um, and then I'll, I'll come back with some concluding comments and we'll be available for questions. Thank you, Marcus. Good morning, board. Um, as Marcus said, we provide um, some educational tools, some narratives for how to start thinking about and how we spend a billion dollars uh, every year at the county. Um, one of the nice features in this website is our, our new county services page, uh, again, in partnership with ISD and specifically our uh, GIS team. Uh, we were able to build uh, this county services page so you can um, users can search for their address uh, if they you know can use our current location now um, Juliet would you mind typing in 701 Ocean Street So we can use our current location and it will bring up um, 
uh, a link to the supervisor, um, which will be Supervisor Coonerty, and also a link to the um, jurisdiction that provides municipal services. So in this case, uh, it, it would be the city of Santa Cruz. Um, and so we provide that information. Um, there are other, um, other links and, and access to services that, that are provided on that view. Um, and so there are just a lot of different uh, different things that people can look up and find out about how services are provided uh, where they live. Um, and so the other piece that we're that we've tried to do is we provide a narrative, but if people want to find out, um, you know, the specific things that they've that they that they care about. Um, they can find that within the department budgets and I'll just provide a brief example of of how we've done this by looking at our um, newly combined community development and infrastructure department. Um, and so as Marcus said, one of the um, one of the things we were really trying to do with this new website was link the the budget and the strategic and operational plans, which really means connecting you know the budget to the county's major work and connecting the budget to the impact that we're trying to have in people's lives to make them better. Um, and so for each department, we've provided a mission statement uh, department. In this case, we've provided an overview um, for the new department and org chart. It has you know, general information about the total expenses, revenues, general fund contribution and staffing. And then, uh, and then it provides a, a basic sort of organizational chart of how the department is organized. So we can see we have transportation um, and I'm gonna focus a little on community planning. I apologize for that. Uh, so within our permit center, you can see we have expenses of $7.8 million, funded staffing of 47.5 uh, staff, and then operational plan objectives related to uh, the creation of a permit dashboard, uh, the creation of a green lining pilot, and then the creation of the unified permit center. So all, um, all really important objectives designed um, you know, to improve uh, people's experience uh, in the planning permit center. Uh, you can see if you click into the service, it provides a brief overview of what it does and some of the emerging issues around the creation of the permit center, um, staff support to um, improve services, and then again, a link to, um, to the planning dashboard that was, that was created and presented to the board in January. Um, you can also uh, click into these objectives and, and see their progress. They're linked from the operational plan site. Uh, and so as you flip through the different services, the, the objectives come in and out and you get different views of each service. Um, for, for those that want to dive even deeper, there are options up here in budget dashboards, detail, budget details and personnel details. Uh, in the budget dashboards, you can see that we've provided um, a view of expenses by service. So again, if we wanted to look at within community planning, which is about 7.8% of the total department, uh, we can see that here the permit center is about 47% of the of that department of that services or that division's expenditures. Um, so it gives you a little bit of a, a view into how that money is uh, is allocated. You can also see those views over time by switching to a bar graph or to a line graph, um, however you want to see it. And in our transparency portal, uh, you can create all these views. Um, or all the way down to, to the object code of our budget. Uh, for folks who are a little more uh, traditional and want just the numbers, we do provide that as well in the budget detail. Uh, here again, you can uh, sort by division. So if we wanted to look at community planning and then just the permit center, we can do that. Um, we can see the expenditures in a traditional three-year layout with actuals, uh, the current year budget and the proposed budget, and then also the changes. And so you can see 
but there are expenditures, revenues, uh, the fund contributions, and then at the bottom, the description of changes uh, where we talk about staffing changes, uh, changes to, to contracts, changes to fees, uh, et cetera. Finally, we also provide personnel details for each department. And here again, you can see um, the staffing. And so if we click just into the permit center, we can see that 47.5 um, proposed and funding, funded staffing. And you can see exactly what those um, classifications are. And, and so what people are doing and what staff are actually providing this service. Uh, and so that's a brief, that's a brief tour. Uh, I would encourage folks to use the, the help pages. There's also uh, an option to um, email us at budget at santacruzcounty.us for folks that wanna provide uh, additional feedback and help us make the site better. Uh, we're really open to that. As Marcus said, this was our first uh, attempt at doing a really, um, you know, a really developed online budget. And so, um, you know, we hope to we hope to be able to build off this and improve as we go forward. And I'll turn it back to Marcus. Thank you. Uh, I'll con conclude with I, I showed before our four prior versions of the budget, our downloadable PDF of our budget in brief. This website is now interactive across all devices, all platforms, so you can view it on your mobile phone. Um, it navigates very seamlessly, easily with drop down menus. As Finn mentioned, there's a contact uh, contact us on the website or any mobile device or any or any device at all, and you can enter your information, your name, and that comes to us to a routing tree. So we have we're creating more ways to interact with the public and, and really understand the questions that they have. We plan some to do some uh, community outreach uh, in the summer and fall and prep for next year's proposed 23-24 uh, budget, and so we can consider the revisions and updates we might do to the website based on community feedback. And I want to come back to um, a couple points. Uh, it was nice not having to think about printing documents that are stored in storage lockers and cabinets all throughout the county. Um, I don't know how many years go back in different departments or different offices, but if we stacked up every county budget that is on the county's property right now somewhere, it'd probably be pretty high. <laughs> so we're, we're pretty excited about not being a, a, no longer producing that level of content that's really not very uh, used from a historical perspective. We're reducing our environmental impact, which we're really excited about. And we're creating a dynamic tool that we hope can really go beyond the power users that have used the budget in the past and, and be able to make this community communication device. And I want to come back to thanking Carlos Palacios, our CAO, who really had a vision and, 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 and push to say we can do better and we, and we should do better. And we start thinking about how we link this to our, our strategic plan. Thank the board, um, yourselves, for your support and, and, and feedback through this process. I think a lot of county staff who we had focus groups, your board, yourselves, um, your board analysts, who gave us a lot of feedback um, from December through our launch on April 29th. And we were literally making changes the week before based on that feedback. And it was, it, I really appreciate that. And I want to come back to thanking our ISD team. Uh, they were phenomenal in, in the work that they've done and in the creativity. Sven leading the project. Uh, we had a lot of staff in the CEO's office, Eric Friedwick, who's here with us today, who had a capital projects element of this. And we're just, we built a really strong platform that we're, we're seeing a lot of possibilities in the future of using this, this new platform. And I thank OpenGov for their partnership. They were a really great company to work with and provide us really rich, diverse content that we can now play around with and really do some wonderful data analysis. So with that, I conclude my comments and I, and I go back to our recommended actions. Again, this is not a budget hearing. Uh, this is setting in place the, the to accept and file the 22-23 budget, um, to accept the tentative budget hearing scheduled for June 21st through 23rd, and our last day on June 28th to set the June 21st um, budget hearings of the first day of our budget hearings and set June 28th, 2022 uh, as a day to hold our public hearing on unified fee schedule and direct the clerk of the board to publish all the official notices. So with that, it concludes our report. Thank you very much, Marcus and Sven. Are there questions or comments from members of the board? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll just briefly say, uh, it, it's really great to see this come full circle from uh, some years back, Supervisor Coonerty uh, had me sit in his small 
uh, Prius at the time. We drove all around the state when we were going county to county before we hired uh, CAO Palacios to look at the ways that other counties were doing various things, the way that the CAOs interacted, the way that they provided transparent information to the community. We learned a lot of best practices, uh, which I know the supervisor community continues actually with the, with the work that he does now. And this uh, type of idea was one that was brought back at the time from that, but it was not as extensive or clear or transparent as what you have accomplished here. This is a really remarkable tool for the community to learn about the budget. I mean, county budgets, government budgets, although always available to the community, always seem opaque to the community. And this really takes away that opaqueness and provides a clarity and transparency and the ability to drill down in a way that we've never been able to provide uh, in this community before and no other city or no other county within our region is doing. And so it's a great, it's a testament to the innovation of the leadership here in the county, but but most importantly, it's a legacy moving forward and an expectation of transparency and availability of information in particular about the most important thing we do, which is the budget. Uh, and I appreciate that this is an iterative process. I know that that uh, there will be that the feedback from the community now that this is out and from the county staff will make it continue to evolve. I know that as, as we continue to drill down, I'm sure there'll be things that we'll discover that need to be modified, but just having this opportunity is a significant shift and I appreciation you, Mr. Primatel, and also Mr. Safford on your work on this project. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Supervisor Coonerty? Sure, yeah, I, I, to echo uh, Supervisor Friend's comments, um, you know, I think when we towards what we heard were the best operating counties uh, around California, we saw that there were some areas that, that our county was acceler excelling in, but there were a bunch of areas and transparency and setting of outcomes, uh, strategic plans, um, online documents was an area that <clears throat> we were pretty far behind. And um, I want to commend the staff for developing this. This is actually yeah, as far exceeds um, any expectation I have and the fact that you were able to do it uh, in-house uh, with the existing talent we have in the county uh, is really great. I think it is a great um, communication tool. It's great for transparency. Uh, my one question was um, within the county, how are we planning to deploy this so that your average line level staff, uh, your mid managers and managers uh, are using this tool as a way to focus on you know, when we have a lot of competing needs and demands on people's times, how are they focusing on uh, using this this tool as a way to to set those needs and priority and uh, expectations within their departments? A wonderful question. It's something we've been given a lot of thought to. Um, one thing I didn't mention: this is, we're phase two of a three pronged project here. We've done a sprint project where we went live with capital projects. We've now gone live with our online budget. And in the fall, we start our last component of that, which is actually integrating this whole system into an operational budget. So what we're gonna see next is giving our departments more tools. We started with a, let's, let's satisfy the public demand and then come into the fall with providing those resources for, the, for our county operations. So what we expect is in the development of next year's budget, um, staff will have more capability and a lot more efficiency in the develop of next year's budget cycle. Um, and once we're live with the fully integrated system, there'll be a lot more, you know, I mentioned the word opportunity. There's a lot of opportunity. We've already started sketching out the vision plan of many different ways we can use this system. Um, not only the website, but the power behind it. So we're really excited about that. Um, so allow us to still be in the iterative process to try to listen and, and see what the needs are from an operational perspective and try to really understand how we can use this to, to better see those, suit those needs. Great, thank you. I look forward to hearing about it. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Supervisor Caput. Uh, you're on mute, Supervisor Caput. There we go. Uh, thank you very much for the report. Uh, I, I guess what I like about it, it's clear, it's readable, it's concise, and it's uh, transparent. And uh, I am uh, looking forward, actually, to seeing how it works and uh, when we get together on in, uh, the end of June and uh, we look at the budget and 
hopefully we're able to balance everything. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Kaplan. Super yeah, I, I'll reiterate the uh, comments and thank uh, Supervisors Friend and Coonerty for taking the state to the state trail and finding out how we could improve our budget processes. But uh, at that time, I think we saw that we were doing a pretty good job at, at the, uh, uh, when they when they were making that tour a couple of several years ago. Uh, I want to thank the CAO and um, uh, Mr. Pintel, Stafford, uh, Fried, Friedlich, uh, Friedman, uh, Friedlich. Um, you know, and I, but just to get down to some of the things we face, uh, like no other county in essence, um, in the past two years, of course, it's COVID's been uh, with us all, but the CZU fire. And this will allow uh, us transparency to see how we can react to this. And we need to go into this budget session realizing that we, uh, we'd like to have more from uh, some other agencies if we could. We have a great many COVID expenses uh, that we may not be reimbursed for. Uh, the road cha uh, challenges going dating back to 2016, 17 and the recent um, uh, fires that we've had. And both of these are really disappointing. Um, and collectively, they, they represent about 20 to $25 million. And um, we, we need, we're trying to see how a budget can work. Uh, it's not, they can't fix that without the money, uh, those, those issues. And it's also worth noting that our, as was stated, our county receives a very low share of property and sales tax revenues comparatively. Um, and as Santa Clara County has 4% of its population in the unincorporated area, we have about half of our population in the unincorporated area. And that's a structural challenge to uh, not to those who presented the budget to us, but what we can do with what we have. And um, and it requires a great deal of thoughtful planning uh, and the requests. And I think this um, really pinpoints what we're doing to make that transparent to the general public. Um, and we're planning requests uh, because of some of those um, limitations of what's coming in and what we have uh, as a population to serve in this county. And so we're gonna uh, go for some more uh, locally generated tax revenues uh, that are needed. Um, the pro proposed transit occupancy tax increase uh, that'll still put us at, at or below those of many other counties throughout the state and the single use cup fee. Um, we. Um, one thing that is a concern too, uh, our reserves that we did a, such a tremendous job in getting up to 10% uh, are now down about the 7% level. And um, that's a concern if we should have another disaster of how we, we can accommodate something immediately. Uh, so I'm uh, with all that said, uh, we face challenges that are just part of our budget that we, we have uh, that we have with the sales tax, the revenues we get. Uh, and I just think this is going to help us a lot in letting the public know uh, what we're doing with the limited resources we have and the declining resources we have in some instances. Uh, this is a great presentation, and I think the public will be very appreciative of uh, their ability to wind through this budget process as we go into it at the end of June. So thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. I'll just add, yes, this is a really fantastic win, uh, both in terms of transparency and efficiency. Uh, we won't have to continue building a tower of budget books to the moon, um, and hopefully it'll be a lot easier to continue to prepare the budget going forward. And certainly it's easier for my office to field questions about the budget, and um, it's really a, a pleasure to explore this tool. So thank you to you uh, both and the whole project team. Are there questions from members of, or sorry, comments from members of the public? Seeing none here in chambers, is there anyone on Zoom who would like to comment on this item? We do have one speaker. Monica Morales, your microphone is available. Apologies, folks, that was an error. Thank you, Monica. All right, well, then if there are no other uh, no members of the public wish to comment, I'll return it to the board for action. Move the recommended actions. Second. second. Right. Motion by Supervisor Coonerty, second by Supervisor Friend for uh, to adopt the recommended actions. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. 
Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. That item passes unanimously. Thank you. That uh, the proposed budget being accepted and the tentative budget hearing being scheduled for June 21st, 23rd, and June 28th, we will now proceed to item nine, which is a public hearing to consider resolution confirming proposed fiscal year 2022 2023 benefit assessment rate and service charge reports for county service areas number 53 numbers 53n and number 53s for mosquito abatement and disease control as outlined in the memorandum of the agricultural commissioner and for a presentation uh, we have Amanda Polson and, and Juan Hidalgo. Uh, good morning, Chair, members of the board. It's a pleasure to be here. And today with me is our Assistant Vector Control Manager, and uh, she's going to be introducing today's item. Good morning. I'm Amanda Paulson, the Assistant Manager for the Mosquito and Vector Control Division of the Agricultural Commissioner's Office. The County Service Area CSA 53 was established in 1993 and then expanded in 2004 and 2005 for South and North County respectively to provide mosquito control and public health services to Santa Cruz County. These services are funded by a benefits assessment and rates are adjusted each year to account for inflation. On April 12, 2022, the board set today, May 10th, as the public hearing date on the proposed benefit assessment and rate reports that will provide operational funding for mosquito and vector control in 2023. The CSA rates presented have previously been approved by the board and are outlined in the rates attachment and either remain at the same level as in 21 and 22 or have rates and a consumer price index increase of 3% as approved in previous elections. These rates have been posted in the local newspaper and have made available to the public at the clerk of the board and mosquito and vector control website prior to today's hearing. If approved, rate reports will be forwarded to the auditor controller by August 10th to be included in the 22-23 property tax assess assessment role. We recommend that the board open the public hearing to hear objections or protests to the proposed three assessment rate reports for CSA 53 which include the North and the South in the original. Then please close the public hearing and consider adoption of resolution confirming the benefit assessment rate reports for the fiscal year 2022 to 2023. Thank you for your support. Thank you. I'll officially open the public hearing. Are there any comments or questions from members of the board? Seeing none. Uh, we'll open it uh, to the public. Is there anyone here in the chambers that wish to comment on this item? Seeing none, is there anyone on Zoom that wishes to comment? We do not have any speakers for this item. All right, then I'll return it to the board for action. You know, Mr. Chair, just one brief comment of appreciation. I, I know that we try and every year to acknowledge that this, we're very fortunate in our community to have uh, those that are working on this issue, work on this issue. It's a very small uh, cost for each community member uh, to really prevent what could be a very serious outbreaks, which we've seen across the world and other situations. And so I just want to appreciate the staff that they uh, do this work behind the scenes um, and I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Thank you. So we have a motion by Supervisor Friend and a second by Supervisor McPherson. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Supervisor Caput? Aye. Aye. Yeah. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. Thank you. That passes unanimously. Thank you. We have uh, that resolution being adopted for the benefit assessment rate reports uh, for county service areas. Uh, we will now close the public hearing and proceed to item 10 to consider adopting resolution approving the Santa Cruz County Active Transportation Plan, which identifies projects to reduce barriers to walking and biking as outlined in the memorandum of the Deputy CAO, Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. For a presentation on this item, we have Russell Chen and Amelia Conlon. Welcome. Uh, 
I don't think so. Go ahead and press the gray button on the base of the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a slide presentation that you pull up for us? Good morning, Chair Koenig and members of the board. My name is Russell Chen. I'm with Community Development and Infrastructure. And I have here with me Amelia Conlin with Ecology Action. And we're here to present the Santa Cruz County Active Transportation Plan. Next slide, please. This is what we'll cover. We'll, we'll go over the plan overview and timeline, public outreach process and findings, recommendation process and overview, project evaluation and plan impl implementation. Before we get into the plan, I'd like to acknowledge that this was a collaborative effort. We partnered with Planning, Health Service Agency, Ecology Action, Bike Santa Cruz County, and we also had a stakeholder committee that was made up of residents, local business owners, and other agencies, and they provided valuable input. Okay, next slide, please. The active transportation plan, the vision is to create a network of biking and walking routes that connect key destinations within the county and are safe, comfortable, and accessible for community members of all ages, backgrounds, and abilities. The plan is for the unincorporated county. It doesn't include the cities. The cities have their own plan. The plan is focused on the urbanized areas of the county. It updates the 2011 bicycle transportation plan. It is also the first comprehensive plan for future pedestrian facilities. The plan will help prioritize projects, especially because of limited funding, it would help identify most competitive projects for grant funding opportunities. It also includes connections to the coast rail trail, but does not address trail design. With that, I'll turn it over to Amelia. Thank you, Russell. Next slide. So I will, my name is Amelia Conlin. I'm a planner with Ecology Action and we were happy to partner with the county on this plan. And I'll talk about the project timeline and the public outreach process. This was about a two year process to develop the active transportation plan. And our timeline was affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. We had originally planned on starting public outreach in spring of 2020, but that was pushed to fall 2020. And then we spent most of last year developing the draft recommendations that you see in the plan. We also held two temporary demonstration projects to test out some of the draft recommendations from the plan. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in a few slides. We developed the draft plan in fall of 2021 and released the draft plan for public comment this spring. And we're here before you to present the final plan. Next slide. So here's an overview of the public outreach that was conducted during this planning process. We did again have to shift our outreach strategies due to COVID-19 away from in-person events and towards uh, social media and digital outreach. We held three virtual public meetings and um, in shifting away from outreach at in-person events, we ended up doing some in-person tabling in parks and neighborhoods, um, trying to reach people where they were already walking and biking. And that ended up being an effective strategy and allowed us to reach people in different parts of the county that were not reached through our online outreach. We also held the two temporary demonstration events to test out some of the draft recommendations from the plan. We developed a project website with an interactive map where people could leave comments on the barriers to walking and biking and the types of projects that they would like to see in the future. And we received 342 comments through that mapping tool. We received 600 responses to an online survey and reached about 4,500 people through social media. And we had a great group of partners helping to share those social media posts and get the word out there. 
As Russell mentioned, we pulled together a stakeholder committee at the beginning of the planning process that included residents from around the county, local business owners, and staff of partner agencies and organizations, and they advised us throughout the planning process. We also held eight neighborhood stakeholder group meetings, and this was a really a way to um, flesh out the comments that we received during the first phase of public outreach and make sure that we were hearing from folks from across the unincorporated county. And so we held small group meetings with stakeholders from Davenport, uh, from each of the communities in the San Lorenzo Valley, from Santa Cruz Gardens, the Amesti neighborhood, and the College Road neighborhood outside of Watsonville. And that really helped to give us a clear picture about the barriers and constraints to walking and biking in those areas. And then finally, we presented to the Regional Transportation Commission's advisory committees, both the Bicycle Advisory Committee and the Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Committee, as well as the Community Traffic Safety Coalition throughout the planning process. Next slide. And here is just a very high level overview of what we heard throughout all that uh, public outreach. We heard from the majority of survey responses that respondents that they would like to be walking or biking more for their daily trips to school, uh, to work and for errands. Um, so there was a lot of interest shown in uh, safe walking and biking. We asked people about the top barriers or the top concerns that they have about walking and biking now in the unincorporated county. And the top response, probably not surprisingly, was missing sidewalks, followed by unsafe intersections, aggressive drivers, and high traffic speeds. And when we asked people at the public meetings what types of projects they would like to see going forward, um, separation from motor vehicle traffic was a theme that came up. Um, we heard about a desire for more separated bikeways that have a barrier between people walking or people biking and moving traffic. Um, of course, we heard a lot of support for the coastal rail trail, support for more sidewalks and more off street paths. Um, so really a lot of interest in walking and biking and um, hearing that more separation is gonna help people feel safe doing that. Next slide. We also uh, hosted two temporary installations as part of the planning process. And this is something new for Santa Cruz County. The goal here was to test out some of the draft recommendations from the plan on a temporary basis as a way to get feedback from the community um, and hear whether uh, they thought that these projects should be made permanent. It's also a way to test how the designs work in practice. Um, so really a trial before the county moves forward with a permanent project. And our first project was a class one separated path on Green Valley Road between Amesti Road and Pinto Lake Road, um, connecting Amesti Elementary and Pinto Lake City Park. And we heard that this, this stretch was really a priority, especially for the school community. And we heard a lot of positive feedback from the public um, on this project. And the county has actually moved forward and successfully applied for a Clean California grant and been awarded $5 million for a two mile, uh, 10 foot wide separated path along with bus stop improvements and landscaping and education programming at MSD Elementary. So this is exactly what we're hoping to see from this type of project. We wanna demonstrate that it works and that it has community support um, and then move forward with grant applications. Next slide. Our next installation project was on Portola Drive uh, between 41st Avenue and 36th Avenue. And the design for this project was based on the Portola Drive streetscape study um, that was completed a few years back and had a lot of community input. For this project, we temporarily uh, changed the roadway from two lanes in each direction to one lane in each direction with a center turn lane. And that allowed us to install uh, temporary class four separated bikeways on each side of the street. We also added some intersection improvements. And the feedback on this project was much more mixed. We did hear some support from cyclists who liked the changes, but we heard a lot of frustration from community members about the slower travel times um, going through this corridor. And so the recommendations for Portola Drive were revised as a result of that feedback um, from class four separated bikeways to class two enhanced bike lanes. Um, there is some more work that the county is doing to study future changes on Portola Drive and there will be more community process before any major changes are made on this corridor. Next slide. And then the final stage of the public outreach process was releasing the draft plan for public comment. Uh, that went live on our project website at the end of February and was up for a month. 
we received 67 comments from the public and that resulted in 16 new or revised projects in our project list and 42 changes overall to plan content um, to text or, or maps within the plan. Next slide. So I'll talk a little bit about how we developed the recommendations in this plan and then turn it over to Russell. Um, we had a, a two-pronged approach here. Our first step to develop these recommendations was working with a consultant, Copenhagenized Design Company, um, and they conducted a data analysis of all county roadways based on existing bike and pedestrian facilities, collision data, disadvantaged communities data, and the number of public comments that we received around each corridor. Um, and they used that data analysis to score each roadway in the county and then selected the top 30 top scoring streets um, to develop corridor recommendations that impacted the entire corridor, entire length of a street. We also added to that list all of the projects or all of the corridors um, that are prioritized for bike and pedestrian use in the general plan sustainability update. So making sure that all of the streets classified as active connectors and main streets were also included on the list to have uh, corridor recommendations developed. And then Copenhagen Eyes uh, developed a typology system that uh, Russell will go into in a moment and assigned each of those top scoring st streets a typology recommendation. We also fleshed out that recommendations list by looking at public comments. So all of the public comments that we received during public outreach were reviewed and all of the ones that related to a specific location or that could be addressed through an infrastructure change were reviewed with the project team. Um, and we really took a deep dive into all of these comments and had a conversation about what a possible recommendation could be to address the issue that was brought up in the public comment. And so that process resulted in 136 recommendations for new sidewalks, for intersection improvements, and other spot treatment recommendations throughout the county. And then finally, we added recommendations from previous planning efforts for new bike and pedestrian projects to this plan in order to give the county a comprehensive list of bike and pedestrian projects uh, going forward. And so recommendations for county roadways from the Highway 9 Complete Streets Corridors Plan are in this list. Uh, projects from the Complete Streets to Schools Plan, which was completed a few years back. Uh, and then the segments of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail um, in the unincorporated county are added to the project list as well. And with that, I will turn it over to Russell. Thanks, Amelia. So I'm going to go over the um, some of the recommend next slide, please. I'm going to go over some of the recommendations and and the corridor typologies. Um, these recommendations in the plan address entire roadways and and long stretches of roadways. Um, the picture on your left there is a long distance rural route, um, rural rural roadways that are that are too narrow for other types of bike infrastructures like on Eureka Canyon, Glenwood Drive. And treatments may include signage, striping, to alert drivers to watch for cyclists. And then um, the two pictures in the middle there are traffic calm residential streets. Um, these are low volume, low speed residential streets. Um, treatments may include curb extensions, road bumps, and share arrows. And then the picture to your right is a class two bike lane. These are typically reserved for roads without large number of destinations. These are painted lines along the shoulders with at least five, foot, five feet width for cyclists. Next slide, please. Um, the two pictures on your left there are class two enhanced bicycle lanes. Um, these, these are recommended for existing class two bike lanes with large number of destinations. They include striped buffers, uh, green conflict markings, and protected intersection treatments. And then the picture in the middle there is a class one shared use path. Um, these are typically on rural roads that connect important destinations for people walking and biking. They're a paved path that is completely separated from the street. And then last we have on your picture on the right is a class four separated bikeway. These are a medium to high volume urban streets such as Soquel Drive. Um, these are on-street bike paths that is separated from the motor vehicle by a vertical element. Next slide, please. Um, this map kind of shows an overview of, um, 
of all the improvements, uh, corridor improvements um, recommendations. And these are the short-term ones. Next slide, please. Sidewalk and intersection recommendations. These are um, sidewalks and spot treatment type recommendations. There are a number of recommendations in this plan. Um, so I will, I'll just highlight a few of those. Um, we have green conflict markings for bike lanes. These are typically at our intersections where our highest conflicts are. We also have high visibility pedestrian crossings. So, so our typical um, crosswalks, standard crosswalks are two parallel lines and the high visibilities are the ladder and the piano style crosswalks. And then leading pedestrian intervals. Um, this is at the signalized intersection. And when the signals change, this will give the pedestrians a head start. And then to take advantage of some of our routine maintenance, we, we're, we are already incorporating some of these recommendations as part of our resurfacing projects. Next slide, please. So our general plan update will include a draft vision zero policy. And then um, planning, the planning on this, we're also planning on design criteria updates to support bike and pedestrian facilities. And as part of our active transportation grants, um, we have and we will continue to um, have education encouragement programs associated with infrastructure improvements. And then as part of the plan recommendations, we'll be looking to develop um, bike parking. With that, I'll turn it over to back over to Amelia. Thank you. Um, so next I'll talk just a little bit about the evaluation criteria. And so the next step of the planning process was to score each of the infrastructure projects included in the plan um, based on the criteria that you see on this slide. And I wanna provide some context about the purpose of this exercise. We're not trying to determine the order in which the county constructs projects or say which projects will be constructed and which ones won't. We're really trying to provide a tool here that you as decision makers and county staff can use to match these projects to the best uh, possible grant funding source and to prioritize between projects, knowing that there's never enough funding to go around to construct all of these. Um, so just wanted to provide that context. And so each of the um, projects was scored based on five criteria, starting with safety, this was the most heavily weighted criteria. And so we're looking at proximity to bike and pedestrian collisions here. This is something that um, grant funders look at um, in your grant applications. And we know that this is not a perfect metric. We know that there are some corridors in the unincorporated county where people don't feel safe enough to walk or bike now. And so we don't see bike and pedestrian collisions, um, but this is the best available data that we have to work with. And it is something that grant funders look at. So this was, this was the way that we had to um, use, to create the safety metric. We also awarded points to projects if they close a gap in the existing bicycle or pedestrian network, or if they install new infrastructure for people with disabilities. And so this was primarily new sidewalk uh, projects or new bike facility projects where there are no bike facilities now. We also awarded points to projects that are low in cost or complexity. And the goal here was to provide the county with a list of projects that may be uh, relatively easier to install. Um, so projects that are not the multi-million dollar multi-use path, but projects that involve uh, mainly signage and striping and may be able to be constructed using local funds. We also looked at equity and awarded points to projects that serve uh, disadvantaged communities as defined by the regional transportation plan. And again, this is something that grant funders look for. And finally, we awarded points to projects that were identified um, in community comments. So if a project came up frequently and had five or more comments around that location, it received five points. Um, if a project was identified uh, by two or more community comments, it received five points. Next slide. And so after we had completed that scoring exercise, um, we developed a top priority project list for each of the districts. 
again, this is not necessarily, these are not necessarily the only projects that will be constructed in these districts, but this is meant as a tool um, for you to be able to see which projects score highly using this criteria. And we were aiming for a top five top priority project list, which ended up being very tricky um, because many of the projects were tied for the number one or the number two spot. So you should see here the top eight priority project list for district one. Um, I think we have 20 something projects on the district two list. Again, that doesn't mean more projects will be constructed more quickly in district two. It's, it's really meant as a tool. Next slide. And I'll turn it back over to Russell. Thanks, Amelia. So plan implementation, we have a large list of projects with limited funding, as you know. Um, so for large projects, we'll need to leverage local funding with grant funding. And then we'll also look to incorporate some of these projects as part of development. And then we'll also take advantage of ongoing maintenance projects, as I mentioned earlier, to incorporate bike and pedestrian improvements. We have done this in the past, and we will continue to do this. Next slide. The recommended action is to adopt the resolution approving the Santa Cruz County Active Transportation Plan. With that, is there any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chen. Thank you, Ms. Conlon. Questions or comments from members of the board? Uh, Professor Mr. Chair, yeah, I really appreciate this um, being a board member of the Regional Transportation Commission as well as Metro. Um, really essential, probably as many comments of any subject I get is on transportation, uh, not only at those two agencies, but throughout um, the, my visits in the county. And I just want to congratulate the Public Works team for this effort, and especially you, Mr. Chen, and uh, Ecology Action, and Ms. Conlon. Um, and for being such a such a small county, we really have an enormous challenges with the topography we have and so forth of our transportation systems. And um, I, it's terrific that we do have this transportation plan. We really need it as a footprint to say which way we want to go. Excuse the pun, but um, I just uh, really do appreciate you're getting for uh, moving forward. Uh, you're correct. There's a lot of projects at little funding. We haven't heard of that dilemma before. But uh, in the meantime, if I could just encourage every motorist, as you said, uh, we could make everybody as uh, motorists um, and drivers if, if we just tone it down and not be so aggressive in our driving and uh, you just slow it down a little, just tone it down. I think we could do that in every part of uh, our society uh, throughout this county. Uh, but uh, this is really something we desperately need, and I think it's it's a good a good uh, as I said, uh, footprint again to get us started and going somewhere. And uh, it's taken a lot of time to get here. It'll talk take a lot of time to implement this, but it's desperately needed, and people really want it in Santa Cruz County. So appreciate all of your efforts and everybody else who participated in this effort. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Mr. Sure, Sheriff, I'll, just, I'll add on to that appreciation, but also note um, that you know our county has one of the highest incidents of vehicle versus pedestrian and vehicle versus bicycle incidents in the state of California, depending upon the year. Sometimes we have some of the highest levels of fatality and injuries associated with it, and it's been that way for quite some time. Having a planning document like this uh, position ourselves for better funding moving through the state, as was evidenced by Ms. Conlon, the work that was recently done on Green Valley Road is the first step of future improvements that will uh, erase that issue within our community from a safety standpoint. It's not just affording people an alternative means of transportation, it's also affording them a safe method to do alternative methods of transportation. And I think that uh, this document is an important uh, marker to accomplish that because ultimately we're going to need the funding for these improvements throughout the county. So I just want to uh, add that appreciation and also the recognition uh, as Supervisor McPherson had noted that we have challenges in our community and those challenges are represented yearly in the Switters data through California Office of Traffic Safety that do show that we have a disproportionate number of of, of issues here that face pedestrians and bicyclists and, and hopefully a document like this can position ourselves to make those improvements moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. 
Yeah, certainly the um, we, we face enormous challenges in terms of safety here on our roads. And uh, we know that members of the public, as your as the plan shows, want to change modes, want to do more walking and biking. And so it's fantastic to have this uh, list of projects that will help them to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I know, as Supervisor McPherson said, we, I do uh, receive lots of comments about uh, potential uh, safety improvements on our roads, whether it's more sidewalks or uh, safer intersections. And I, throughout the course of creating this plan, I forwarded a lot of those over to you and it's great to see all of those represented in the plan um, i've had lots of opportunity to, to provide comments myself on this plan those are also represented here so i think it's a very comprehensive plan um, and hopefully we can execute as much of it as possible and i'll just say um, also with the with the pop-up projects um, really both of them are incredibly valuable you know i, I don't think we can expect uh, everything that we conceive of on paper to ultimately be successful and i think that most importantly I, we realize um, just how important this build, measure, learn process is. And hopefully we can continue to do more similar projects going forward on some of the more su significant changes uh, being reviewed here. So that's, uh, right. Supervisor Caput, is there anything that you wanted to add? Just uh, thank you for the report. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's great for the county. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'll open it for public comment. Does anyone want to add a public to this or a comment on this item? We have no one here in the chambers wishing to speak. Is there anyone on Zoom? We do have one speaker via Zoom. Apologies, we now have two speakers. Call in user three. Your microphone is now available. I, I was in a conversation with a friend just now, so I only heard part of this, but I have a question. What does e-sign mean? And also, um, we're talking about uh, safety and walking and driving and uh, these radar signs are not safe. They're highly dangerous. They're, we're getting microwave radiation. I have a painful reaction in my body every time I go by one. And there are signs that could be put up about crosswalks that just show a person walking across. It's not like you're getting zapped. Um, so my question is, what part of this involves wireless microwave radiation technology. Could you respond to that, please? Because that is not safe. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. I'm sorry. Teresa Rogerson, your microphone is available. Thank you. Hi, this is Teresa Rogerson from um, County Public Health, and I just want to say that I was uh, in a lot of meetings over the past year or so with Russell and um, Amelia, and I just wanted to commend them both on their leadership in this project. It was very challenging to do outreach, uh, especially during the pandemic, um, but we found creative ways to do that and um, not only connected with the communities, um, in the unincorporated area, but also um, made some connections um, within our agencies. Uh, we were working, you know, side by side with the road crews and that sort of thing. Um, so it was uh, a really, like, you know, like you were saying earlier, it was a really um, educational process to go through. And we hope it was the same for the community members that were engaged in it with us. And um, just wanted to say thank you to Amelia and Russell for their leadership. Thank you. We have no additional speakers. All right, then I'll return to the board for action. Move the recommended actions. Second. Motion by Supervisor McPherson, second by Supervisor Friend. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend. Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. Thank you. That item passes unanimously. Thank you. The Santa Cruz County Active Transportation Plan being approved. Thank you uh, again, both Mr. Chan and Ms. Conlon. We will proceed to item 11. 
Item 11, as the Board of Directors of the Davenport's County Sanitation District, we'll have a public hearing to consider ordinance amending Title III of the District Code, establishing 2022-2023 water service charges, and ordinance amending Title IV of the District Code, establishing 2022-2023 sewer service charges. For the Davenport County Sanitation District, direct the Clerk of the Board to place the ordinance on the May 24th, 2022 agenda for final adoption, set Tuesday, June 28th, 2022 at 9 a.m. or thereafter as the date and time for a public hearing on the service charge reports and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the district engineer. I'll officially open the public hearing. And for a presentation on this item, we have Ashley Trujillo. Thank you. Thank you, board. So we are here today uh, to talk- Can we just check your microphone, yeah. please? Does that work? I think so, yes, thanks. Good morning, Board of Directors. This is Ashley Trujillo, Senior Engineer for the Davenport County Sanitation District. Today was set as the date for the public hearing to consider the ordinance establishing charges to the sewer service, I mean, for the sewer service charges for the district that will be effective as of July 1st, 2022. These charges have been developed by the district's revenue consultant, Hornberger Engineering, and are set to be in proportion with the cost of service for each customer classification. The water service charge is proposed with a 4.9% 4, 4 increase with a 5.1% individual maximum. The proposed sewer service charges would generate $100,000 to cover the district's share towards approximately $2.8 million in grant-funded projects. The remaining funds generated by this increase are necessary to meet projected operation and maintenance requirements of the water system for the town of Davenport. With the district required to set aside capital to move forward with the grant funded water projects and taking into account recent completed sewer projects, the capital budget for the sewer system has been reduced to $14,000 for this fiscal year. The reduction results in a proposed sewer service charge decrease of 3.5% overall with a 2.7% individual minimum decrease. Therefore, we recommend that the board hold the public hearing and upon its conclusion, consider approval and concept of the ordinances amending district code title three, chapter 3.08, article three, section 3.08160 through 3.08180 for water service charges and district code title four, chapter 4.08, article three, section 4.08160 through 4.08180 for sewer service charges for the Davenport County Sanitation District. Also direct the clerk of the board to place the ordinances on the May 24th, 2022 agenda for final adoption. Set Tuesday, June 28th, 2022 at 9 a.m. or thereafter as the date and time for the public hearing on the sewer service charge reports and direct the clerk of the board to publish the notice of public hearing once a week for two weeks before the hearing in a newspaper of general circulation. I'm available for questions. Thank you, Ms. Trujillo. Are there any questions or comments from members of the board? Uh, the only comment I have is, um, as we all know, the Davenport uh, folks pay some of the highest water and sewer rates in the state and the country because um, there's a small district and the costs are spread among a, a small number of users. I want to take a moment to thank Ashley and the, and the public uh, work staff for doing everything they can to keep those rates low, but also ensure that we're meeting the water, water quality standards and the other requirements. and keeping a system functional. And um, it's always a delicate balance, but I appreciate over my time on the board, the, the work that's gone in to, to balance those competing needs. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Any further comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll open it for public comment. Is there anyone on Zoom wishing to comment on this item? We have no speakers via Zoom. All right, then I'll return it to the board for action. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Motion by Supervisor Coonerty, second by Supervisor Friend. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. Thank you. That item passes unanimously. Thank you. Those ordinances being adopted in concept. The ordinance will be placed on the agenda for final adoption on May 24th, and the rate changes 
we placed on our June 28th agenda for a public hearing. I'll officially close the public hearing on that item. And we will proceed to item 12, which is as the Board of Directors of the Freedom County Sanitation District, public hearing to consider ordinance amending Title III of the District Code, establishing 2022-23 sewer service charges for the Freedom County Sanitation District. Direct the Clerk of the Board to place the ordinance on the May 24th, 2022 agenda for final adoption, set Tuesday, June 28th, 2022 at 9 a.m. or thereafter is the date and time for a public hearing on the service charge reports and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the District Engineer. And for a report on this item, we have once again, Ashley Trio. Thank you very much. Uh, and I will officially open the public hearing. On March 8th, 2022, the board set today as the date for the public hearing to consider the ordinance establishing charges to the sewer service charges for the Freedom County Sanitation District that will be effective as of July 1st, 2022. The proposed service charges reflect an overall increase of 7.4% with a 9.4% individual maximum. These increases are necessary to adequately fund the district's treatment, maintenance, and operational costs, as well as fund capital improvements for the district's aging sewer system. We therefore recommend that the board hold a public hearing and upon its conclusion, consider approval and concept of the ordinance amending district code title three, chapter 3.08, article three, section 3.08, establishing the 2022-23 sewer service charges for the Freedom County Sanitation District. R direct the clerk of the board to place the ordinance on the May 24th, 2022 agenda for final adoption. Set Tuesday, July 28th, 2022 at 9 a.m. or thereafter as the date and time for a public hearing on the, sewer, on the service charge reports and direct the clerk of the board to publish the notice of public hearing once a week for two weeks before the hearing in a newspaper of general circulation available for questions. Thank you, Ms. Trujillo. Any comments or questions from members of the board? Seeing none, are there any members of the public wishing to comment on this item? I think we have no speakers for this item. All right, then I'll return to the board for action. I'll move for approval. Second. Motion by Supervisor Caput, uh, second by Supervisor Friend. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend. Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. This item passes unanimously. Thank you. That ordinance being adopted in concept will return to uh, for our final hearing on May 24th, and the rate charges will uh, return for a public hearing on June 28th. Well, now, thank you, Mr. Hill. We'll now proceed to... Item 13, a public hearing to consider, I'm sorry, I will close the public hearing for item 12. I'll move to item 13, public hearing to consider in concept ordinances of the Board of Supervisors of the County of Santa Cruz amending chapter 7.128 and 13.10 of the Santa Cruz County Code for proposed modifications to setbacks for commercial cannabis cultivation in the commercial agricultural zone district and technical amendments and make findings of exemption from the California Environmental Quality Act, schedule the ordinances for second reading and final adoption on May 24th, 2022, and take related actions as recommended by the Planning Commission and as outlined in the memorandum of the County Administrative Officer. And for, uh, I'll officially open the public hearing. And for a report on this item, we have our Cannabis Licensing Officer, Sam LaForty. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Koenig. Uh, could I have the presentation? Oh, And Mr. LaForte, just double check that your microphone is on. Yes. We're on item, this is, uh, yeah, 13. Thank you. Uh, One moment, Sam, I just need to share it via Zoom. One moment. There you go, thank you. 
Good morning, board members. I'm here today to present ordinance amendments as recommended by this board and the Planning Commission. Uh, for context, the board has not been unanimous with regard to these amendments. I just wanna give a quick review of how we got here. At the August 24th meeting, a board member identified an elevated community concerns surrounding cannabis cultivation in the CA zone adjacent to residential uses. Uh, the board directed staff to evaluate those concerns at a future meeting. On October 19th, staff presented an analysis of those concerns and a variety of options for, board, for the board to consider moving forward. On October 19th, the board um, motion that was passed stated revised setbacks in the CA to align with the original code approved. This includes a 400 foot setback from residences to outdoor grow areas, which is twice the setback than allowed in other agricultural operations. The original code also allowed for setbacks down to 100 feet subject to a level five use permit as a load as allowed in all other zone districts and to further define setbacks for indoor cultivation to be 100 feet from residences to cultivation area and 50 feet from nursery operations to residences. Staff presented the code modifications to the Planning Commission at their February 9th hearing, at which time the Planning Commission recommended uh, the board approve the proposed amendments and CEQA determination. Uh, for clarity, the CEQA determination the Planning Commission reviewed was only applicable to Chapter 1310 modifications, and the CEQA determination presented for the board has been revised per County Council to address changes to both Chapters 1310 and 7.128. The proposed setback modifications will align the CA zone with all other zone districts for outdoor cultivation by increasing setbacks to 400 feet from adjacent residential structures. This was the originally approved setback until it was modified in June 2020. Setbacks for indoor cultivation are proposed to remain the same. Setbacks for nursery operations um, are proposed to decrease to 50 feet. This is due to the nature of nurseries being similar to other commercial agricultural nurseries. The plants at these nurseries cannot flower, therefore there should not be any odor associated with these operations. Additional modifications to code are all minor in nature. They include clarifying some language to meet the original intention of code, removing some redundancy in paperwork, shifting the responsibility to county staff, and allowing the CLO to designate responsibility to staff and formalizing the security plan approval process. Lastly, I'd like to answer any questions the board may have on the proposed ordinance modifications and say thank you for your time today. Thank you, Officer Laforti. Are there are questions or comments from members of the board. Mr. Chair, I don't have any questions. I do have some brief comments. Um, I mean, it, won't, it won't surprise the board, obviously. I'm, I'm still disappointed in the way that this process has gone over the last few years, and it, it really only impacts uh, two districts within the county. In fact, the board uh, over time functionally wrote out uh, some zones that would have impacted other districts, but yet, uh, here we are with all the impacts occurring within two districts. Uh, those are the two districts are arguing for uh, greater setbacks and lack of conflict with residential areas, but haven't been able to find uh, a board majority and support. I mean, just to put this in perspective, a lot, a large part of this discussion over the last few years has been based on what ended up becoming a false premise of, of a sense of economic windfall and economic development and generation possibilities associated with an industry that's in total free fall and economic collapse right now. None of the tax numbers that were estimated from uh, the CLO's office or the CAO's office over the last few years have come to fruition. Uh, many of the cultivators are seeking to not renew their licenses because of a difficult market, but yet the way that, that this board is responding is saying, uh, the way that we're going to deal with that is by expanding the possibility into a market that isn't even uh, possible to do it in areas that can create conflict as opposed to limiting it in areas that they would never be able to fill anyway in areas that wouldn't create conflict. It doesn't make any policy sense. It doesn't make any reasonable sense. And there isn't a board member here that would actually vote to put this next to their house, but yet uh, they're doing exactly that right now. And just to give a sense 
on sort of what these set setbacks are. I mean, just to put into perspective, I mean, most of these are smaller. Uh, right now I'm coaching my son's uh, Aptos Little League team. I'm one of the coaches on the team. And, you know, the T-ball fields are are actually larger than the setback proposals that we're having here, uh, where somebody's going to be literally living with their bedroom window uh, 100 feet in some situations or 50 feet if it's a nursery, so to the pitching mound a distance. I mean, th these are exceptionally small setbacks that are being proposed and we're celebrating them as though that there's some sort of expansion but they're not really an expansion that has any true meaning uh, for any of my constituents or supervisor caput's constituents i still think that since a lot of this was sold on a bill of goods on economic development that didn't end up being reality and i've heard my colleagues uh, on the board bring it up i mean supervisor koenig was a, it was a key emphasis point of view at the last meeting uh, because the numbers were provided by the cannabis licensing officer about the, the quote unquote theoretical tax that would be lost should we uh, do the restrictions that were from parcel line that would only uh, allow for 800 parcels to be grown as opposed to 1400 parcels. Yet none of those numbers are even coming anywhere near reality. And so why in the world when we're basing it off of that as a concept would we continue to expand and create these conflicts with residentially zoned districts? It's just been a disappointing process altogether. Uh, it, it continues to be disappointing and I hope that the board would still consider the opportunity to move back to uh, what we had discussed, which is to provide greater protection specifically against residentially zoned parcels. By the way, this still puts nearly all of the growing in my district. It still puts nearly in a small portion in Supervisor Cabot's district. It wouldn't extend it into any other district. Um, as you know, there are absolutely no sites within Supervisor Coonerty's district, and there, at least as of now, is one site in Supervisor McPherson's district. So you'd think that there would be some sort of understanding or deference to those that are representing the area and the things that we believe to be issues, still allowing the entire industry to occur within our district, but instead, trying to find a balance between that and the residential areas. So um, I'm not gonna be supportive of, I mean, just like I was last time of what's being proposed today, I'd welcome the thoughts of my colleagues on this in regards to whether there's a way to continue to make this better. The planning commission was, was equally divided on a three, two with the exact same concerns. Um, and so that's, I do have appreciation though, uh, for all the work that Mr. LaForte has done over the last few years and, and Ms. Sereno in particular, I mean, it's, a, it's an evolving and difficult industry with a lot of, challenges associated with it. I just think that county staff, that we, we need to challenge ourselves that when we make fact-based statements that help influence public policy, when those statements don't end up be, uh, bearing fruit over time, you need to come back and actually acknowledge to the board and the community that they're wrong because policymakers make decisions based on these estimates and this information. Uh, so we have an equal responsibility to come back and say, look, you passed all these ordinances based on a promise that didn't end up being true. Should the board consider maybe revisions as a result of it? I've never seen that happen. Uh, still waiting for it to happen. And I think that that's part of what's led us down the path of, of where we are today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Any other comments, members of the board? Yeah. Supervisor Cabot. You bet. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I won't repeat, uh, I, I agree with uh, Supervisor Friend. Uh, this uh, uh, directly affects uh, residents and uh, and uh, people in District 4, which is my, my district and also Supervisor Friend's uh, district. I, I guess what I'm getting at here is I almost always, I, I can't remember, going contrary to something that is uh, very personal to somebody, uh, uh, some other supervisor's district. Uh, I figure they know their area better than uh, I do, so I usually go along with their recommendation. In this case, uh, District 4 and uh, Supervisor Friends District are, uh, we, we have to deal with the great majority almost of all of the, uh, you know, ca cannabis setbacks. So I, I found it uh, difficult to understand why three out of the five uh, would actually support this change. Um, but anyway, if, uh, if one of the other supervisors reconsiders, and votes uh, along with uh, myself and voting no on this, but uh, it's uh, kind of late in the game, right? Thank you, Supervisor Cabot. All right, 
right, seeing no further questions or comments, are there any members of the public wishing to speak to this item? We do have one speaker via Zoom. Vicki Shepard, your microphone is available. Thank you, supervisors. I want to give a special thanks to Supervisor Friend and Supervisor Cabot for again challenging the other three supervisors to consider how this would feel if it was in your backyard. And I am so, so disappointed with the way that vote came down um, at the last Board of Supervisors meeting. As I am directly affected to the 110 Crest neighborhood, I've spoken with others across the county in South County that are terrified about the, the fact that these setbacks are now even smaller to cultivation projects than you would even have at a cannabis shop in downtown Sacramento and downtown Santa Cruz. Now, the Planning Commission voted that these proposed changes are exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, but it is our understanding of CEQA that the county has the responsibility to provide evidence to support its claim that these changes are exempt from CEQA. And this has not been provided. Common sense would dictate that reducing the setbacks from what was previously proposed for indoor greenhouses and, nur and nurseries would more likely negatively impact neighborhoods and, in the, and the environment as our, it will ours. And we had so many neighbors show up, so many people from the county show up asking you to take this into consideration. And what my, my perspective and many others was that the, the, this was a preordained decision by the other three county members, and I'm extremely disappointed. Thank you, Ms. Shepard. Thanks, thank you. We have no further speakers for this item. All right, then I'll return to the board for action. Mr. Chair, I'll uh, make the recommended action. Um, I'll just, let me just preface because uh, Supervisor Friend asked for um, input and I'll miss these dialogues uh, that we have had over this issue for uh, all these years. I'm sympathetic and I understand the frustration. Um, I would, I, I think the big difference is that this is an area that's zoned on for commercial agriculture, uh, which means that it's the place where commercial agriculture will occur in our county. Um, my district has a place that's zoned for, uh, you know, college and educational use, and it has big impacts. Um, and sometimes the board has been supportive of uh, trying to mitigate some of those impacts, and sometimes they haven't. Um, and uh, we also are the place where almost all the county services, uh, the jail, um, as well as homeless services are provided. And I would, um, I have neighbors every day asking me to move those services out of the city and into uh, the unincorporated areas uh, of the county. Um, so each of us has specific impacts that are felt in our district that are different than other districts. And we have to try to make the best policy. Um, I'll point out again that uh, in these greenhouses, you could have hemp with no, uh, no essentially regulations or setbacks that would have the same um, odor impacts that would have. You could have flowers being grown using pesticides. Uh, you could have all kinds of commercial ag uses. If you treat cannabis as a crop, um, this is the most regulated crop uh, that we uh, allow in our community. And, um, and we're trying to find a balance between allowing it to be an industry, but while also um, creating setbacks and uh, impacts. And because of the some of the market failures, you may be seeing many of these greenhouses moving towards uh, industrial hemp, uh, where there will be uh, virtually no, will there be no county regulation uh, or setbacks. And so you could have similar impacts, have more impacts um, if we don't create a, uh, a, a way for the cannabis growers to, to, to operate in this county. So I'll move the recommended action. Motion by Supervisor Coonerty, second by Supervisor McPherson. Any further discussion? Supervisor Caput? 
Yeah, when, uh, if the uh, county council can explain one more time why this does, uh, uh, ordinance does not require a four-fifths uh, vote uh, rather than uh, just a simple majority. Because the law allows for, for, for this ordinance to be adopted by three-fifths. A zoning ordinance doesn't have to be adopted by four fifths. Okay. Any further discussion? No, oh, Mr. Chair, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it, Supervisor Coonerty's comments. I think that maybe then this board or future board should consider on future updates that we, um, since these, uh, it appears as though people feel that this is a well regulated and non impactful industry that we expand this into maybe timber production zones or other zones that were within the third and fifth district so that we can at least uh, share that responsibility across the county and, and give more opportunities for the cannabis industry to be throughout the county um, because historically we've we've moved it into one specific area for for um maybe maybe that would actually be a, an interesting discussion for this this board to have is, is is ways that it can move into other agricultural ancillary zone districts as you know uh, those are agriculturally zoned districts that the board specifically precluded and and p perhaps uh, moving forward that would be a, a, a discussion to have but I appreciate uh, supervisor Coonerty's comments on that I'll, I'll be voting no on the item thank you supervisor friend all right seeing no further discussion clerk roll call vote please Supervisor Friend? No. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? No. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. That item passes three to two. Thank you. That ordinance being approved in concept will return to our May 24th meeting for final adoption. And I'll close the public hearing. Right, uh, we have remaining on our regular agenda today, a 1.30 item. Um, so we will now move into closed session. We'll take a 10 minute break and convene closed session at 11.50. And uh, we'll see you back here for open session at 1.30 PM. And there are no reportable items from closed session. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everybody. We'll now resume the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors with our scheduled item, item 14. Uh, clerk, before we do that, though, uh, Clerk, will you please call the roll to make sure we have everyone present? Absolutely. Supervisor Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. And Koenig? Here. Thank you, Chair. You have a quorum. Thank you. So uh, we'll proceed with item 14, a public hearing to consider in concept ordinance of the Board of Supervisors of the County of Santa Cruz repealing Santa Cruz County Code sections 1310-660 through 1310-668, adopting new sections 1310-660 through 1310-664, and amending sections 1310-312, 1310-322, 1310-332, 1310-343, 1310-344, Seventy two regarding wireless communication facilities, adopt resolution affirming amendments are exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act, schedule the ordinance for final adoption on May 24th, 2022, and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the interim director of planning. And for a report on this item, we have David Carlson, senior resource planner. Thank you, Chair Koenig. Um, this item would overhaul the county's wireless facilities regulations by repealing and replacing the existing um, wireless regulations. On December 7th, the board conducted a study, study session on the proposed ordinance. And on March 9th of 2022, the Planning Commission held a public hearing on the proposed ordinance and recommended approval by the Board of Supervisors. Oh, could you bring up the slides, please? Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'll start with some background uh, information on regulation of wireless communication facilities and then explain why our local regulations need to be updated. Um, I'll also include some images later in the presentation demonstrating some of the changes. Uh, the Federal Telecommunications Act of 1996 was intended to promote competition and reduce regulation and encourage the rapid deployment of new telecommunications technologies. The federal law preserves local zoning authority over placement, construction, and modification of wireless facilities, but with certain limitations. The county can't discriminate amongst providers or effectively prohibit personal wireless service. The county must act on permit applications within certain timelines and may not regulate based on the environmental effects of radio frequency emissions. Therefore, our local zoning authority can address issues such as siting, design, and operational impacts of wireless facilities, including designating zone districts where they are allowed, height limits, screening, and camouflaging standards, and addressing physical impacts of placement and operation of wireless facilities, such as vegetation modification, grading, lighting, and noise. The county's existing wireless ordinance is over 20 years old, and over that time, various additional federal and state regulations and legal rulings have been issued to keep up with technology and streamline the local permit process. The first two limitations on local zoning authority that the county can't discriminate among providers and can't prohibit wireless service have been interpreted by the FCC and the federal courts to mean that the county must allow a wireless service provider to substantially reduce a significant gap in service, even if service is available in the same area by a different provider. Uh, however, the county retains the ability to require the gap be reduced in the least intrusive manner. And that has typically been determined through extensive alternatives analysis and on certain applications uh, by applying certain aesthetic requirements. Uh, regarding permit processing timelines, the FCC has mandated shot clocks, which are very aggressive timelines for communities to act on certain types of wireless uh, facility applications. And technological advances in experience with wireless facility installations have, have led to new definitions and requirements in federal and state law for small wireless facilities, modifications to existing facilities, and installations in the public right away. Uh, comparing the existing and proposed new ordinance is detailed in the crosswalk document attached to the board memo, and some of the major changes are highlighted on this slide. Uh, currently, co-location is only encouraged 
um, in the existing ordinance. And in the new ordinance, it would be required unless there is no existing facility that would provide substantially similar coverage. The list of prohibited zone districts would remain the same, but there would be some additional exceptions listed, including uh, small cell facilities, co-locations, and modifications of existing facilities. Exceptions to prohibited zone districts would be considered based on an alternatives analysis that documents a substantial reduction of a significant gap in the least intrusive manner. Uh, the new ordinance includes height standards uh, with a requirement to minimize height and allowance for excep exceptions to height based on the same exception criteria. Uh, whereas the existing ordinance requires processing all new wireless facilities permits at the zoning administrator level, the new ordinance proposes different permit types based on the type of facility. Basically a discretionary permit, including standard public noticing would continue to be required for new non co-located wireless facilities, but other common types of uh, facilities would be processed as building permits or encroachment permits. And the new ordinance includes new sections addressing um, facilities in the public right of way and uh, modifications of existing facilities. Uh, the different shot clock timelines reflect the nature of certain types of, of wireless facilities, co-location of, wire, of wireless facilities and eligible modifications of existing wireless facilities, uh, for example, have the shortest timeline for the county to act on the application of 60 days. Uh, by definition, these types of facilities can generally be constructed with minimal to no visual or operational impacts um, subject to certain criteria. The key criteria in the proposed ordinance for co-located facilities is not defeating any concealment elements of the existing wireless facility um, or adding concealment elements to the, to the co-location that would render the facility completely non-visible or architecturally integrated with the building or surrounding environment uh, using screening or camouflaging techniques. Uh, so essentially the facility looks like a normal part of the building or surrounding environment. Um, additionally, the new ordinance would allow ministerial processing of new wireless uh, facilities on existing commercial, industrial, or public facilities, including schools. The key criteria for these uh, types of wireless communication facilities is either complete concealment, so the facility is not visible at all, or architecturally uh, integrated, like um, previously described. Um, and by the way, this uh, image is of the Wilson Tire facility uh, uh, structure in downtown SoCal, and there's a couple of wire facilities on the roof of this building. Uh, the antennas uh, uh, appear to be to look like stovepipes, and um, and the equipment enclosure uh, looks like a um, a normal maybe uh, air conditioning unit enclosure that you would see on the top of a commercial building. Um, and then this is an image of a public storage facility on Portola Drive, and there is an existing wireless facility um, on the roof of this building um, behind that uh, parapet in the back. So that would be completely concealed. Okay. Um, it's also become increasingly common to construct small wireless facilities on existing infrastructure in the public right of way. And the new ordinance includes a section specifically addressing these types of applications. They would generally be processed as ministerial encroachment permits by the um, Community Development Infrastructure Department, uh, provided they meet the definition of a small wireless facility or represent modifications of an existing wireless facility that uh, qualify as an eligible facilities request and that they meet a specific uh, criteria in the ordinance. Requests for other types of uh, wireless facilities in the public right away would not be processed as encroachment permits only, but would first require a discretionary uh, conditional use permit processed by um, uh, the Community Development and Infrastructure Department prior to obtaining an encroachment permit. Uh, the new ordinance includes objective criteria for review of wireless facilities in the public right of way that qualify for an encroachment permit only uh, to minimize impacts of these facilities in the right of way. Uh, the criteria include a list of prohibited locations, specific criteria for wood utility poles and metal streetlight poles, 
Uh, dimensional criteria, including height and volume of antennas and, equip, um, and equipment are the, uh, the same as the definition in federal law of a small wireless facility. Um, additional criteria for wood uh, utility poles includes elements designed to minimize the visual clutter on the pole, including shrouding the antenna, concealing the cabling, equipment enclosures, uh, flush mounted and no wider than the pole. Um, and for metal poles, their criteria is meant to achieve the same goal to minimize clutter, but uh, they have an advantage in that uh, they are hollow and can house the wireless equipment uh, internally or um, or in separate ground mounted equipment boxes. And here's a couple of images of uh, wireless facilities on wood utility poles in the right of way. The image on the left is a, actually a simulation and you can see the wireless equipment uh, near the bottom of the pole below the transmission lines and you can see the antenna um, on the top of the pole above the transmission lines. And then on the right, um, you can see the antenna uh, below the transmission lines and, and below the street light. They're on the side of the pole, and then you can see the equipment um, near the bottom of the pole. And then here's an example uh, from a manufacturer's brochure of a metal streetlight pole uh, that is designed to house all the equipment um, internally to the pole with the antenna above the light uh, standards. And then here's an image um, on Ocean Street with the county building in the background and the Starbucks on the corner. And that is a wireless antenna on top of that streetlight pole in the median. And the equipment cabinet is in the background uh, to the left under that tree on the side of the road. Uh, the new ordinance includes a section specifically addressing modifications of existing wireless facilities to fully and accurately reflect the provisions of federal law, the, the Spectrum Act of 2012, that apply to these types of projects. Um, these installations are called eligible facilities requests, which is defined as a modification that doesn't represent a, a substantial change to the tower or base station. Um, there's detailed criteria in the ordinance defining a substantial change. Um, and again, the key criteria is that the proposed modification must be limited in dimension and must not defeat the existing concealment elements of the existing tower or base station. Um, these would be processed as ministerial building permits or encroachment permits, depending on their location. Um, and in this image, um, there is an existing facility in this tower on top of the Ben Lomond Fire Station. And so uh, a, an eligible facilities request here that is within that same enclosure, meaning it does not defeat the existing concealment elements would be processed as a building permit only. And I'll show a couple of other examples of eligible facilities requests that can include um, additional equipment or modifications of equipment on a tower such as this, as long as um, it meets certain dimensional criteria in terms of um, height and width. Um, and then I wanted to show finally a couple of images of this is a um, monopole tree tower in Aptos. Um, and this would be a, you know, this was originally a new wireless facilities. And so that would be processed as a discretionary permit, um, but also um, an eligible facilities request on this um, current installation could potentially be processed as the building permit. And then here's another image of a monopole disguised as a tree at the Pasa Tiempo exit off of Highway 17. Um, and I don't even, I don't know if you can notice it, but there is a tree in there that has antennas on it. There's a fake tree in there that has antennas on it. Um, and so overall, the changes in the new ordinance um, generally consist of clarifying language, removal of repetition, an overhaul of the overall structure meant to facilitate more efficient administration of the ordinance. Uh, there's new provisions for ministerial encroachment permits um, that'll provide more efficient uh, process to comply with the shot clock timelines in federal law. 
Um, certainly there remains many discretionary apps, aspects of some of these types of applications and an effort was made in the new ordinance to provide language that will also facilitate more efficient processing of discretionary applications for wireless facilities. Um, in addition, because the existing ordinance applies both inside and outside the coastal zone, staff is recommending repealing and replacing two identical versions of the ordinance, one inside and one outside the coastal zone. And it, so in this way, the existing ordinance will remain in effect inside the coastal zone until certification of the new ordinance by the Coastal Commission. Um, and so staff is recommending that the Board of Supervisors conduct a public hearing to consider the proposed amendments to the Santa Cruz County Code and local coastal program that modify regulations related to wireless communication facilities, adopt the attached resolution, finding the proposed amendments are consistent with the general plan and local coastal program and exempt from further environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act, and direct staff to file the CEQA notice of exemption and submit the local coastal program amendments to the California Coastal Commission for certification. Um, approve in concept an ordinance repealing Santa Cruz County Code sections 1310-660 through 1310-668, adding sections 1310-660 through 664, amending sections 1310.312, 322, 332, 342, 352, 362, and 372 regarding wireless communications facilities outside the coastal zone, approving concept and ordinance accomplishing the same thing regarding wireless communication facilities inside the coastal zone, schedule both ordinances for second reading and final adoption on May 24th, 2022, and direct staff to implement the amendments outside the coastal zone 30 days after adoption and inside the coastal zone upon final certification by the California Coastal Commission. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. I'll officially open the public hearing. And are there questions from members of the board for Mr. Carlson? Supervisor Friend. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I just have more of a comments than questions of appreciation for Mr. Carlson for all of his work that he's done throughout this process, the community outreach, uh, the work with the Coastal Commission, et cetera, leading up to today. Uh, there's really no question in in my mind, especially given the amount of, of outreach I've received from the community requesting these modifications over the course of years or just improvements uh, to cell coverage in general, that this is uh, really one of the, the most important investments that we can make toward um, both equity, safety, and, and uh, environmental issues in our community. On the equity side, uh, many, many, many uh, residents in uh, both in my district and some of the other districts that are disadvantaged, young residents, um, local residents of color disproportionately use and rely on wireless communications for their entire internet access. Um, it is to, to disadvantage those communities by having poor access just continues to propagate the inequities that we have an ability here to solve, and we also saw highlighted during the pandemic the essential need on it. On the safety side, uh, there's no question that with the tragedy that we had at, at Aptos High School, many people attempting to uh, call 911 that were unable to. In fact, 80% of calls to our local 911 center come in from cell, uh, cell phones and not landlines. In many rural areas where there's car accidents or accidents involving pedestrians or bikes, there's an inability to call for help. As you know, every second counts in situations like that. In the tragic fires that occurred in Supervisor McPherson and Supervisor Coonerty's districts, uh, we were pushing out alerts to people on phones that they weren't getting as a result of having inadequate cell coverage. And people were also trying to call other loved ones but were unable to because of lack of coverage. So from a safety standpoint, there's no question. And even on the environmental side, as we've seen an increase in people working from home and not, not uh, having to commute, uh, this provides an opportunity on the economic and environmental side to really do though to help improve those things. I mean, the, you would think, based on the coverage capacity, the coverage and capacity we have in our county, that we're living in an exceptionally rural area, and we're not. We're right in the shadow of of Silicon Valley and one of the greatest economic engine generators in the history of time, and yet we have uh, coverage that would make you think that we were uh, somewhere completely different than that. And so I, I I do support these changes. I think that they're absolutely important. Uh, for the reasons that I outlined, and I'd like to see our continued investment in equity recognize that that many uh, people are relying on these for both a life safety economic component 
uh, and for just their their access to the outside world via the internet. And, and we're not doing enough so far. And I think today will be the first day in starting to change that and ensuring that they have that access. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Supervisor yeah, I, I totally agree with um, Supervisor Friend. Uh, there's two words, uh, safety and equity. Now, we just really experienced that um, and we're, we're able to respond. Um, we did as well as we could. We did very well with what we had. But I think as Mr. Carlson said, this has been, it's been a long time in the making. This hasn't been updated to this extent in 20 years. And Lord knows how much, you know, our, our um, capabilities have increased in that period of time. I, I just say it's about time. I I look forward um, and I thank the, the Coastal Commission staff for submitting its comments, but, uh, and I, I look forward to working out the differences that we have with them, but I'm, um, this can't come soon enough under the circumstances. And we, we have another fire, uh, fire season staring us in the face right now. And uh, we, we can't do this fast enough for the, the, the safety and the, uh, the equity in our community. So thank you for putting so much time into this and uh, great presentation. Uh, it's much needed, has been for a long time and it's about time. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, uh, I've got a question, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you. With the status quo the way it is right now, uh, the change would be uh, uh, making it faster and easier and more streamlined, right, to put in these uh, facilities. Uh, so what I'm getting at is technically today with the, the way we're doing it, we still can put in cell towers if we needed to in certain areas. but. What what is this big rush to the future right now uh, as we go forward? Uh, is it because we want to streamline it, make it easier, and have less input from the public, or is it because we have some other agenda? Can you answer that? I th I think that the main answer to your question and one, and one of the main drivers here is the uh, FCC's um, rulings over time and legal rulings over time that have sort of outrun our ordinance and we need to keep up with um, the new shot clocks, uh, the um, FCC uh, orders on small cell facilities and eligible facilities requests. Those are all putting um, uh, strict timelines on the county to act on some of these applications. And so we're trying to facilitate that in the uh, updated ordinance. Okay, is that, that's gonna affect, uh, the shot clocks will affect the time limit uh, that the public would have for input. Is that correct though? Uh, for an application that requires a public hearing, there, there would be uh, no change in the opportunity for the public to have input in those situations. There would be standard public noticing and public hearings um, to, to take that input into consideration. Yeah, but the deadline for the public uh, input would be uh, uh, a shorter time a timeline. No, there would be no shorter timelines um, applicable to the public. The shorter timelines are applicable to the county to act um, and what we have, the way that we've been uh, trying to work around uh, with that um, currently is by working with the providers to um, uh, what's called toll the shot clocks and, and um, come to an agreement with the applicant to uh, actually allow us to go through the public hearing process. But that is, um, uh, that, that, that's not required by federal law. Um, it's it's something that uh, we have uh, implemented in order to work around the existing shot clocks and our existing ordinance, uh, but we're proposing to fix that in the with the in part with the ex updated ordinance. Yeah, uh, when I hear the words uh, equity and all that, uh, uh, those words, uh, how is that affecting? Uh, I guess. Uh, a, a, a real quick question would be, uh, and then the safety concern, uh, at Aptos High School, do they have a, a cell tower facility there right now? And they had one uh, before uh, the horrible incident that took place a year ago. 
Uh, they, to answer that question, no, they no, they don't. Um, and there's one proposed uh, kind of by Highway 1 that would help address this issue moving forward for next year. But of course, it's taken a long time to get through the permitting process because of our lengthy permitting process. But no, there's no uh, tower there. And in fact, uh, there's no ability. Uh, I mean, functionally, there was no ability for many of the students to be able to call 911 as a result of that. And, and as, we, as you may recollect, Supervisor Caput, at the last hearing we had on this, there was a parent that had uh, called in to talk about their inability to get a hold of their own kids at uh, Aptos High as a result of the inability to text or, or call them during this incident. And that's because of, of this lack of of service and and then this ordinance while it doesn't actually create new uh, cell phone cap uh, facilities it uh, it provides the framework by which uh, the carriers can can increase uh, throughout the community so we can anticipate that it'll it'll do that as a result and that's why that's why we heard from the sheriff last time advocating for the ordinance and, and the parents at Aptos High the same thing from a safety perspective right now uh, on the safety perspective uh, I find it hard to uh, comprehend the fact that uh, the, that they couldn't call 911 from Aptos High School. I, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. It's from a wireless line. There's there's very limited coverage and capacity, so it's very easy to overwhelm uh, the capacity that's there with so many people having wireless devices. It's very easy to overwhelm and slow down the system and call as a result of it. And by the way, you know, uh, even our own reverse 911s are done to cell phones, uh, alerts are texted that way. And uh, if you don't receive it, you don't receive it as Supervisor McPherson and Supervisor Coonerty knows that's what happened during the fires. Even some of the PG&E blackouts in advance of them happening, this is how a lot of notices are sent out. And without the, the coverage, people aren't aren't getting it. But yeah, I mean, look, I know that I've seen, uh, I know you drive down Freedom, you're, you're well aware of, of the large gaps in coverage in different parts of Freedom. There are some sections that have some distributed antenna systems around there, but the area right around Aptos High and up into that hillside does not have coverage. Okay, and then I guess uh, <clears throat> Supervisor McPherson can answer this. Uh, when the fires uh, took place, uh, the lightning fires, uh, how many uh, self towers actually burned down along with the fire? Do we have any idea? Because cell towers will will burn up, burn down also, or the poles holding them up, or or the communications. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure were affected. I don't have the answer to that. I can tell. I, yeah. I Does anybody have an answer to that? <laughs> Supervisor Cabot, I, I don't think to, to attempt to answer your, I, I don't, we don't have, I don't know, I don't know that we have that these cell towers up there at all. So I, I just don't, I don't have the answer though. Yeah, Supervisor Cabot, to attempt to answer the, the nature of your question, I think it would probably, I, I don't know the exact, if, if any cell towers were destroyed during the fire, but I think uh, the issue that Supervisor McPherson was raising of many of his constituents not receiving reverse 911 notifications or being unable to text out or call out during uh, during the emergency was was really in relation to the current conditions, the current level of service uh, in the Santa Cruz Mountains, rather than any specific cell towers being destroyed. I think it's just that there's there's not very many of them out there today. Okay. I guess I'd add security. from the in the third district, thousands and thousands of telephone poles burned. Um, and so so there was no landline coverage. And now most of my residents, because of changes in state laws, can't get landlines. So unless they have adequate access to cell phones, they essentially have no communications ability to call uh, emergency services or to be notified of emergencies. Okay. Uh, the other would be uh, under the status quo that we uh, have, uh, we were able to put uh, individual cell towers in those areas so before. So what I'm getting at is the uh, rush to the future here is uh, shorter uh, shot clocks and uh, less restrictions and more streamlining to put in cell towers. So, uh, I mean, we had years of 
in, uh, under the status quo of putting in cell towers in certain areas. So the, the big change is uh, a rush to do this, right? Well, no, I think uh, we can, I, the I conventional. Have the rush. Well, the conventional telephone poles and so forth are not part of the future. <laughs> we're not going to go back to the future on that one. I, I mean, this is, we're going to have to live with the, the communications network that we're going to have in the future. And this is going to provide it to more people uh, more quickly. Uh, and um, it's, I just think it's about time we do it, as I stated before. Yeah, uh, but my point is uh, <clears throat> we're able to do it under the status quo that we have now, though, right? getting cell towers in those areas. I, I would say, Supervisor Caput, that um, it's, it's not so much a rush to the future as keeping up with what has been happening at the federal level and in the courts. Um, and that's what we're trying to do with these updated regulations is um, bring them up to date. Yeah, I, I guess what I'm getting at is, too, is all the money that is on the side of uh, Verizon and uh, T-Mobile and all that, uh, you know, the, the little red dots on the map, uh, they're all competing and they have a lot of money. And I'm getting at uh, uh, their part of this rush also. They're going to benefit from it. And then you have the public, uh, you have certain people that do have concerns with it. And uh, uh, when you have all the money on one side and then you have individual people uh, on the other side, uh, you, you it's like PG&A and uh, uh, what is that, uh, that movie uh, that uh, Bra uh, Brokovich, uh, you know, it's trying to stand up and saying that there is a, a problem in a certain area or whatever. And then uh, uh, that's what makes me a little leery on when I see a big change uh, coming. Uh, money telling us one thing and and uh, the other side saying, well, what about, you know, what about my voice in this? Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Any further questions or comments from members of the board? Seeing none, I'll open it for public comment. Is anyone here in the board chambers? That wishes to address us on this item, please approach the podium. Hello, my name is James Ewing Whitman. Wow, two years ago to 16 years ago, this room would be full. Uh, let's see, on today's information page 241, uh, 14D, 13.10.664. Um, this number 14, I believe, has only 157 pages. I, it's a lot of stuff to print up tonight. So this has to do with the indemnification of individuals, members in this community that are making these policy decisions. Um, you know, I guess we have a lot of things to thank Mr. Clinton for, besides his 1996 signing in of, what is it, the FCC 702. So, you know, the military's greatest silent weapons to control their enemies since before 1959 are frequencies. Um, the first through fourth generation, that's only 35 different frequencies. That's generally zero hertz through six hertz. Um, very useful military weapons. What people call the fifth generation, it's over 3,000 frequencies. So it should go one, two, three, four, 297. And that's overlap from two gigahertz to over 300 gigahertz. Um, you know, you can do your own research, but in 1994, the Rwandan genocide, that was done through frequencies. There's a lot of information out about that. And um, I moved into this county. 1993, I never had good cell phone service there. That's probably one of the reasons why I'm so healthy, but, uh, or that's questionable. Anyway, so uh, we used a landline. Landlines are virtually disappearing. You can't find a, a payphone anywhere. So you guys are really practicing a Hegelian dialect. You're creating a problem and making solutions where I actually wrote down some pretty unpleasant notes here that I'm just not going to say. But um, I wish this isn't the end of this. It's just the beginning. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Whitman. Seeing no one else here in the chambers, we'll take it to Zoom. Is there anyone on Zoom who wishes to comment on this item? Yes, we do have five speakers on Zoom. Ariel Strauss, your microphone is available. Thank you, good afternoon. My name is, Ar am I coming in clear? Yes. Thank you. My name is Ariel Strauss. I'm an attorney with Green Fire Law in Berkeley, California, and I am, I represent a number of residents in unincorporated Santa Cruz County. And I want to start by pointing out that I believe in a statement Mr. Carlson made regarding no change to the zones that are subject to the various restrictions and policies of this new ordinance um, is incorrect. The <clears throat> new ordinance removes the rural residential and the rural agricultural zones in 1310660C4 from restricted zones. Which means that those zones are no longer subject to discretionary zoning process. I also want to point out that the primary motivations for these changes is our changes in federal law that apply to the public right of way and to small cells. However, the changes that you're proposing are also being applied to macro cells that under the ordinance can be 75 feet tall and are generally built on private property. And the visual impacts of those are very significant. And it's very important that you have public input because from my experience representing clients in the past in the county, through this process, through the public input process, the designs are dramatically improved. And the federal shot clock, which is also imposed by the state, is 150 days, which is a reasonable amount of time to get through the public process. So I think it's very important that the needful changes and the relevant changes um, not be pushed through alongside changes that really are not in the benefit of the public. And particularly those are changes to the macro cells on private property, and particularly the changes to eliminate the rural residential and the rural agricultural zones from the restricted zones that would subject them to discretionary process. I also want to point out the weakening of the comparison analysis, which Mr. Carlson very correctly pointed out is something that the county can demand and in the past has demanded. And the change has been from conclusively demonstrating requiring that the applicants conclusively demonstrate. Thank you, Mr. Strauss. Well, to only having a substantial evidence. Matthew Kaufman, your microphone is available. I'm coming through. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to address the uh, 1310-660-D exemption section. Uh, it currently, as proposed, it's uh, intended solely, it exempts those intended for personal non-commercial uses, such as shortwave radio. Uh, this is a, a substantial reduction in the exemptions language that currently exists. Um, and there's a couple of things that concern me particularly. One is uh, the exemption only applies uh, for the first part of this for occupants on the site where facilities are located. So that would prevent things like a business owner from putting a ham radio or business antenna on their facility. Um, it prevents remotely controlled amateur radio stations, and it also prevents uh, repeater stations, which might be located uh, for use uh, in emergencies, for instance, uh, that might be located on a business building or might be located on uh, private property, which is not where the repeater licensee lives. Uh, the other part is that the end of this says, uh, wireless communications facilities on privately owned property used solely for pub, pub, public or quasi public use are exempt. It's not clear to me whether that um, used solely is meant to modify property or meant to modify the facilities. Uh, if it only modifies property, uh, then that's uh, again a substantial reduction. I think given that these ordinances only get passed every 20 years, we have this opportunity to fix more than just the FCC requirements. So I would, I would put that in there. Uh, I would also like to see that exempt uh, facilities like amateur radio and public safety antennas are actually eliminated from all permitting requirements when co-located on other structures. Um, and uh, uh, dear to me is that we have an opportunity here, but are not taking it to put in language that allows us to expedite disaster rebuild and in-kind replacement. Uh, right now, I'm trying to do a disaster rebuild of a tower, and it's uh, very slow, and the county's part of that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kaufman. Call in user five. Your microphone is available.
Hi, this is Marilyn Garrett, and what we need is uh, reliable, safe landlines. This is a death technology of microwave radiation from beginning to end. The key problem I see is the dictatorship of the corporate state. Big oil, big pharma, big telecom, including Verizon, T-Mobile, AT&T, SpaceX, and more. They write the laws, dictate policies, and pollute the planet. You didn't include any of the pollution in your report, did you? The result, worst marriage ever when corporations get in bed with government because we all get screwed and we all get poisoned. The consequences we're seeing are ecosystem collapse, the disappearance and death of birds and bees and trees. And I have before me pictures here of dead birds. This article, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of birds died during 2020 U.S. Air Force 5G exercise in New Mexico. You have received over the years documentation of the harm of this technology. Also, Dr. Martin Paul, 5G, great risk for the EU, U.S., and international health. Compelling evidence for eight distinct types of great harm caused by electromagnetic fields, exposure, and the mechanism that causes them. Martin Paul, P-A-L-L, at WSU.edu. This is a document from 1918. You should have a presentation by a doctor on the adverse health effects from this technology. Thank you, Ms. You Garrett. were sent a letter. And I will just clarify that um, as explained in this item, we don't as a county have jurisdiction to uh, regulate environmental health impacts or other health impacts from wireless communications. So if you have an issue uh, with anyone that does have an issue with those uh, elements of this should really uh, talk to their state representatives or federal uh, representatives. Thank you. Caller ending in 1192. Your microphone is now available. Hi. Hi, this is Gail, and I just want to say that any any um, law that is unconstitutional, such as threatening the life and health and safety of people, is people have a duty to resist that law. So I have a, a manual here from Rome Laboratory Air Force Base in New York, 1994, and it's titled Radio Frequency Microwave Radiation Biological Effects and Safety Standards, a review. Under the title of Pathological Report, Soviet investigators claim that the central nervous system is highly sensitive to radio frequency and microwave radiation. The NIOSH technical report summarized the results of a pathological study published by A.A. A. Ledevet and Z.V. Gordon in 1960. The researchers reported that several CNS-related disorders were discovered among 525 workers exposed to RF microwave radiation. The symptoms were listed as hypotension, slower than normal heart rates, an increase in the histamine content of the blood, an increase in the activity of the thyroid gland, disruption of the endocrine hormonal process, alterations in the sensitivity to smell, headaches, irritability, and increased fatigue. Other researchers have acknowledged similar biological effects. Um, EMF fields show alterations in the electrical activity of the cerebral cortex and disruption of the activities of nor neurons. Um, just skipping around here, exposure to microwave radiation has been observed to cause a disruption in the behavior of animals. Um, researchers indicate that behavior be, may be the most sensitive biological component to microwave radiation. This is an equal opportunity destroyer of health. Even if you believe this is safe, these effects are still happening to you. Um, cataracts in humans is another subject. Exposure to microwave radiation is known to cause cataracts in Thank the human eye. Caller ending in 7617. Your microphone is now available. 
Hi, this is Winifred Thomas, and I'm so glad that you're so up on FCC regulations that when they tell you to go to Germany and die in, a, in one of the ovens at Auschwitz, that you're going to be so happy to do that. Because somebody tells you to do something does not mean it's right. Last in the FCC, it has been legally the court case saying that the FCC, there are no safety limits. The safety limits that they said they had, they are not proven. There are no safety limits. If you really care about those kids at, at, at this high school or the black people or anybody, you'll take away their cell phones and put in landlines. Microwaves are unsafe. You know it. And you are aiding to the downfall of, of, of humankind. Those kids at, at, at Aptos High School, how many of them are on antidepressants and ADD drugs because they can't tell the wire, relate the wireless and they don't even know what's wrong with them? Senator, uh, Supervisor Cabot has a lot of great points. And that this bit about you know, wireless being more important, wrong. If you look at the history of safety, the fires, the earthquakes, the problems we've had across the nations, it has been good old landlines, which are more dependable. Oh, there's so many problems here. There's so many things you said which are just so bad. You should be demanding landlines. Good copper landlines are more dependable, more reliable, and they don't hurt people. We're done. Thank you, ma'am. Caller ending in 7887. Your microphone is now available. Hello, this is Andrea Barron. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you so much. So I've lived in Santa Cruz County 46 years. I'm talking to you on a plugged in uh, copper landline. I could speak all afternoon. I want to address the health issues. I know what you've been talking about. I listened to Mr. Carlson's presentation and everything and in, in, in present law about it being concealed, architecturally integrated, et cetera, et cetera, disguised as trees, air conditioners. I want to address the health issues and I could speak to you all afternoon. Ms. About Barron, the health this is not a hearing about the health issues. That For that, uh, you'll have to go to your state legislators. You know what, I, I need to talk, I, need, I am in Zach Friend's district and I've lived here 46 years and was a court reporter my entire life. You folks, please educate yourself about the health issues. Uh, I know you're going forward, uh, looking at all the this, but this is not about equity, safety, or environmental issues that uh, Mr. Friend has said have all been uh, covered. So in September 2019, a few months before we ever heard about COVID, the International EMF Conference was took place in Scotts Valley in Santa Cruz County, and it was chosen by doctors all over the world that came here to Santa Cruz, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of presenters, doctors, physicists, microbiologists, people that treat people with, with EMF uh, sensitivity, uh, and many doctors came from, and I was there for four days from eight in the morning until 10 at night listening to not only the presenters, but doctors that came from all over the world to understand when their patients you, are Ms. coming Barron. in. Brett Woolham, your microphone is available. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thanks. Um, I just wanted to, I guess, balance out uh, what we have going on here. I'm not here to complain about health impacts of wireless. I think there's a, a significant utility for wireless services in our society. And thanks to the supervisors for considering this issue. Um, anything you can do to make broadband service and cellular service you know, more reliable and readily available is, is great. Um, one concern I did have was definition number 28, the actual definition for wireless communication facility. Um, I would like clarification from the supervisors as to whether or not the the, the county intends to uh, have other types of systems that are non-cellular uh, fall under this. That is, you know, ham radio systems, as was brought up earlier, uh, business repeater systems, other technologies, or is this uh, ordinance specific to cellular, whether it be macro tower or small cell or, or other? Uh, I, I would hope it would be the latter, and this wouldn't apply to ham radio and, you know, other community-based services like that. 
but uh, that is not clear uh, at this point in the way that the ordinance is is written. Um, something else I'd like to add is I don't necessarily agree with the broad discriminatory nature of the ordinance. Um, I think that it would be great to have uh, to lean more on encroachment permits and ministerial permits and definitions, uh, allowing carriers to come in and do the work without having to go through long, extensive periods of discretionary review. Uh, it, as a business and as a you know a telecom company, if I go into a community, I want to know what the rules are and uh, be able to invest in that community and not have discretionary permitting get in my way uh, because that can really drag out and increase the costs, drag out the install process and increase the costs and make a community not viable for new technologies. Um, that's all I'm gonna add for now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Willem. David Wachowski, your microphone is available. Thank you, um, you can hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to uh, thank the supervisors for their work on this topic and also to staff uh, for the time that they've put into this. I know it's a complex topic and um, I know that there are many moving parts in this. I wanted to talk about the uh, social aspects of this. Um, I'm a resident of District 2 and speaking specifically about the socioeconomics on this topic, Wireless is by far the choice technology for people in 2022. And nationwide, we have over 60% of the population has moved to wireless technology. They've given up their landlines. Um, in the in speaking nationally, again, approximately 82% of renters are wireless only, meaning they do not have landlines. People who live in poverty, seven out of 10 people who live in poverty are likely to be wireless only. And, and for some of the supervisors in this district that have high Hispanic populations, I would remind you that 77% of Hispanics are wireless only. And people under the age of 34 who are just starting out their careers, over 86% of them are wireless only. And as Supervisor Friend pointed out, 80% of calls to 911 come from wireless phones. When we put this in the aggregate, we have to remind ourselves that by failing to build these networks, we are putting portions of the population who rely on this technology at risk. Uh, landlines were a technology that were 100 years ago viable. Currently in today's world, they are not viable. And I don't think that it's reasonable to expect people who are in, for example, transitional housing circumstances to constantly relocate their landlines. So let's be thoughtful about what we're doing here today. And I'll yield the balance of my time back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wachowski. We have no further speakers for this item. Thank you, then I'll return it to the board for action. Chair, I'm so sorry, one more person just put their hand up. All right. Michael Cintron, your mic is available. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Hi, my name is Michael Cintron. I'm the permitting manager for Crown Castle's small wireless facilities in Northern California. Crown Castle is the nation's largest telecommunication infrastructure provider, owning over 40,000 cellular towers, 80,000 route miles of fiber optic cable, and 60,000 small wireless facilities built or under contract to build. Fast, reliable connectivity everywhere and all the time is essential to modern day life. I applaud the county for its efforts to update and modernize its wireless code to find the right balance in its code to allow for the deployment of these services to the community. However, additional review is needed on this newly proposed code and design guidelines. I'm here today to ask the board to delay the adoption of this code and these design guidelines. As currently written, these guidelines would violate state and federal law, as well as the state utility pole standards that govern the placement of equipment on utility poles, General Order 95. For example, section 13.10.662C4B4 needs to be changed to be in compliance with GO 95 Rule 94E as the minimum distance from the center line of the pole to the maximum. An additional item in non-compliance with state law is section 13.10.662C4C7 and, and uh, C4B8, which prohibit cooling fans. Crown Castle will comply with the applicable existing county noise ordinances that are not more restrictive than required of any other entity. Cooling fans cannot be outright prohibited. If this is left in place, it appears to be discriminatory against wireless communication facilities, as other utility providers utilize cooling fans for their equipment, a violation of PUC 7901.1. 
The section must be deleted to allow for the best and most recent technology to be deployed in your communities as the most recent generation of radios and equipment have cooling fans. This is a non-exhaustive list of items that are in conflict with law that we provided an employee to look at. Um, and we ask you that you delay the adoption of this code and these guidelines to allow for further input discussion to allow for. Thank you, Mr. Cintron. You're welcome. Uh -huh. We have no additional speakers, Chair. All right, thank you. I'll return it to the board for action then. Um, before I entertain a motion, I did a couple of questions came up or I, I thought valid comments uh, during public comment. Uh, the first was from Mr. Kaufman. Um, and it was echoed by Mr. Willem, I believe, about uh, how this ordinance would uh, potentially restrict ham radio use or other uh, amateur radio. Um, was wondering if Mr. Carlson, you could respond to that, or if, if you see that this ordinance would restrict that, or if there's opportunities to improve that. Yes, this ordinance is intended to narrowly apply to personal wireless services, such as that provided by Crown Castle, Verizon, AT&T, et cetera. Um, and it's narrowly focused on that. Um, and the, that exception is also narrowly focused on on that. And so, um, those other um, types of of, um, of um, facilities are not regulated by this ordinance. Okay, thank you. And then the other uh, point brought up by Mr. Centrone about a potential violation of state utility pole standards or allowing for cooling fans. Yeah, um, I, I I understand uh, what he's saying and. Um, those standards are the criteria for uh, qualifying for a ministerial building permit or encroachment permit. It's not a prohibition on those uh, types of facilities that he mentioned. It just means that if you are proposing a facility that does not conform to those criteria, you're into the category of needing a conditional use permit and then a encroachment permit or building permit once you're through that process. So we're not, it's not a prohibition. It's just a categorization of different types of facilities based on their that criteria. Got it. So they're still allowed just with a higher level of review. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'll entertain a motion. Supervisor Cabot. Uh, you bet. Let me, uh, uh, one more question. Actually, it's going back, uh, a few years, but whatever happened to the uh, observation towers that uh, that a ranger would be in the tower uh, 24 hours a day, and if they saw a fire break out somewhere in the forest, that they were able to use a radio, transistor radio, and uh, alert the public that way. I mean, what... Would, do we totally uh, don't have that anymore at all? We uh, nobody has the even uh, maybe has an answer to that. Uh, Supervisor Caput, I, I I have a it's sort of unrelated, but I have spoken with Cal Fire about that kind of a solution about early warning for fires, and I think it's simply that it become cost prohibitive to man lookout towers. Uh, with, with folks at this time. So uh, that was the answer I heard from Cal Fire about why we're no longer using people in, in lookout towers. But uh, we do have a number of cameras uh, positioned throughout the county that fulfill very much the same purpose. Uh, we have four in our county today, three more being installed, including one at the Watsonville Airport uh, with a good view of the mountains that um, have uh, provide early detection of wildfires. And there's additional, I think it gets up to about 20 cameras when you consider Santa Clara County. Okay. And uh, anyway, my, my concern is the money on one side. And I think the current process we have now uh, would have worked in the past uh, to prevent what maybe some uh, people had a problem with in the past. And I think the current process is as good as the proposed process. Thank you. So I'll be voting no. All right, Mr. Chair, I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor McPherson. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? No. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? I'm so sorry, and Koenig? Uh, aye. This item passes four to one. Thank you. Those uh, ordinances being approved in concept, they will return to our May 24th agenda for final adoption. 
That concludes our regular agenda today. Next meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors will be 9 a.m. on May 24th. Thank you all. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. We'll see you all then. Bye-bye.